Good morning, Lost Aaron. Good morning, Lost Aaron Mills Town Center. Three, two, one, take two. Good morning, welcome to Aaron Mills Town Center, the home of the world's largest permanent point of purchase video wall installation. My name is Calvin Fluck, and I'm your video host all day here at EMTV. I want to take this opportunity to extend a very special and warm welcome to the film crew from Necessary Illusions. We've got an excellent lineup of television programming for you today, so let's get on with it. So how long have they been working on this documentary? Gosh, they've been working on it. I don't know how long, but they, I know every, every country I show up, they're always there. They're there, huh? Yeah, they were in England, they were in Japan, all over the place. Jeez. They must have 500 hours worth of tape by now. But they put together a real doozy when they're done, huh? I can't imagine who's going to want to hear somebody talk for an hour, but <laughs> I guess they know what they're doing. So where are y'all from? Florida! Florida? Florida. Yeah. Yeah. Florida. Yeah. 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 Florida. We all talk about yeah. Florida. <laughs> We're making a film about Noam Chomsky. Does anybody know who Noam Chomsky is? No. no. Welcome to Wyoming Talks. My guest today is well-known intellectual Noam Chomsky. Thank you for being on our program today. Very glad to be here. Well, I know probably the main purpose for your trip to Wyoming is to discuss thought control in a democratic society. Now, I'd say I'm just uh, Jane USA, and I say, well, gee, this is a uh, democratic society, and what do you mean thought control? I make up my own mind. I, I create my own destiny. What would you say to her? Mm -hmm. Well, I would suggest that Jane take a close look at uh, the way the media operate, the way the public relations in uh, industry operates, uh, the extensive thinking that's been going on for a long, long period about the necessity for finding ways to marginalize and control the public in democratic society. But particularly to look at the evidence that's been accumulated about the way the major media, the sort of agenda-setting media, I mean the national press and the television and so on, the way that they shape and control the kinds of opinions that appear, the kinds of information that comes through, the sources to which they go, and so on. And I think that Jane will find some very surprising things about the democratic system. I'd like to welcome all of you to this lecture today. Several years ago, Professor Chomsky was described in the New York Times book review as follows. Judged in terms of the power, range, novelty and influence of his thought, Noam Chomsky is arguably the most important intellectual alive. Professor Noam Chomsky. I gather there are some people out behind that blackness there, but if I don't look you in the eye, it's because I don't see you. All I see is the blackness. Uh, Perhaps I ought to begin by reporting something that's never read. Uh, the line about the arguably the most important intellectual in the world and so on comes from a publisher's blurb, and you also always got to watch those things. <laughs> because if you go back to the original, you'll find that that sentence is actually there. This is in the New York Times. But the next sentence is, since that's the case, how can he write such terrible things about American foreign policy? <laughs> and they never quote that point. Uh, but in fact, if it wasn't for that second sentence, I would begin to think that I'm doing something wrong. And I'm not joking about that. Uh, it's true that the emperor doesn't have any clothes, but the emperor doesn't like to be told it. 
and the emperor's uh, lapdogs like the New York Times are not going to uh, enjoy the experience if you do. Good evening, I'm Bill Moyers. What's more dangerous, the big stick or the big lie? Governments have used both against their own people. Tonight I'll be talking with a man who has been thinking about how we can see the developing lie. He says that propaganda is to democracy what violence is to a dictatorship. But he hasn't lost faith in the power of common people to speak up for the truth. You have said that we live entangled in webs of endless deceit. That we live in a highly indoctrinated society where elementary truths are easily buried. Yeah. Elementary yeah. truths such as? Such as the fact that we invaded South Vietnam or the fact that we're standing in the way of significant and have for years of significant moves towards uh, arms negotiation or the, the fact that the military system is to an ex a substantial extent, not totally, but to a substantial extent, a mechanism by which the general population is compelled to provide a subsidy to high technology industry. Since they're not going to do it, if you ask them to, you have to deceive them into doing it. I think there are many truths like that, and we don't face them. Do you believe in common sense? I mean, you're yeah, absolutely. You I do believe in, in Cartesian common sense. I think people have the capacities to uh, see through the deceit in which they're ensnared, but they got to make the effort. Seems a little in Congress to hear a man from the ivory tower of Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a scholar, a distinguished linguistics uh, scholar, talk about common people with such appreciation. I think that scholarship, at least the field that I work in. Uh, has the opposite consequences. Well, my own studies in language and human cognition uh, demonstrate, to me at least, what remarkable creativity ordinary people have. The very fact that people talk to one another is a reflection, and just in the normal way, I don't mean anything particularly fancy, uh, reflects deep-seated features of human creativity, which in fact separate human beings from any other biological system we know. Tonight, scientists talk to the animals, but are they talking back? The Journal with Barbara Frum and Mary Lou Finley. Communicating with animals is a serious scientific pursuit. This is Nim Chimsky. Nim, jokingly named after the great linguist Noam Chomsky, was the great hope of animal communication in the 1970s. For four years, Petito and others coached him in sign language, but in the end, they decided it was a lost cause. Nim could ask for things, but not much more. I would have loved to have a conversation with Nim and understand how he looked at the universe. He failed to communicate that information to me, now we, and we gave him every opportunity. Noam Chomsky, theorist of language and political activist, has had an extraordinary career. I can think of none like it in recent American history, and few anywhere at any time. He has literally transformed the subject of linguistics. At the same time, he's become one of the most consistent critics of power politics in all its protean guises. Scholar and propagandist, his two careers apparently reinforce each other. In 1957, he published his Syntactic Structures, which began what has frequently been called the Chomskyan Revolution in Linguistics. Like a latter-day Copernicus, Chomsky proposed a radically new way of looking at the theory of grammar. Chomsky worked out the formal rules of a universal grammar, which generated the specific rules of actual or natural languages. The general approach I'm taking seems to me rather simple-minded. Uh, and unsophisticated, but nevertheless correct. Uh, <laughs> Later he came to argue that such systems are innate features of human beings. They belong to the characteristics of the species and have been, in effect, programmed into the genetic equipment of the mind, like the machine language in a computer. Uh, one needn't be interested in this question. Of course, I am interested in it. And the interesting question from this point of view would be, what is the nature of the initial state? That is, what is human nature in this respect? That, in turn, explains the... Astonishing... Try the next one. Facility. 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 That, in turn, explains the astonishing facility that children have in learning the rules of natural language, no matter how complicated, incredibly quickly, from what are imperfect and often degenerate samples. Complain. 
Complicated. It's a complicated word. Do you know what complicated means? It means it's complicated. If, in fact, our minds were a blank slate and experience wrote on them, we would be very impoverished creatures indeed. So the obvious hypothesis is that our language is the result of the unfolding of a genetically determined program. Well, plainly, there are different languages. In fact, the apparent variation of languages is quite superficial. It's certain, as, as, as certain as anything else, is that humans are not genetically programmed to learn one or another language. So you bring up a Japanese baby in Boston, it'll speak Boston English. And you bring up my child in Japan, it'll speak Japanese. Uh, and that means that the base, that from, that it from, from that it simply follows by logic that the basic structure of the languages must be essentially the same. Our task as uh, scientists is to try to determine exactly what those fundamental principles are that cause the knowledge of language to unfold in the manner in which it does under particular circumstances. And incidentally, I think there is no doubt that the same must be true of other aspects of human intelligence and uh, uh, systems of understanding and interpretation and uh, moral and aesthetic judgment and so on. The implications of these views have washed over the fields of psychology, education, sociology, philosophy, literary criticism, and logic. In the 50s and 60s, the bridge between your theoretical work and your political work seems to have been the attack on behaviorism. But now, behaviorism is no longer an issue, or so it seems. So how does this leave the link between your linguistics and your politics? Well, I've always regarded the link. I, I've never really perceived much of a link, to tell you the truth. Again, I would be very pleased to be able to discover intellectually convincing connections between my own anarchist convictions on the one hand and what I think I can demonstrate or at least begin to see about the nature of human intelligence on the other. But I simply can't find intellectually satisfying connections between those two domains. I can discover some tenuous points of contact. Il n'y a de créativité possible qu'à partir d'un système de règles. Le problème, alors, là, que je me pose, et où je ne suis pas peut-être tout à fait d'accord avec M. Chomsky, c'est lorsque il place euh, ses régularités à l'intérieur, en quelque sorte, de l'esprit ou de la nature humaine. Je me demande si le système de régularité, de contraintes, qui rendent possible une science, on ne peut pas les trouver ailleurs, en dehors même de l'esprit humain, dans des formes sociales, dans des rapports de production, dans les, des luttes de classe, etc. If it is correct, as I believe it is, that a fundamental element of human nature is the need for uh, creative work, for creative inquiry, for, uh, for free creation uh, without the arbitrary limiting effects of coercive institutions, then of course it will follow that a decent society should maximize the possibilities for this fundamental human characteristic to be realized. Now a federated, decentralized uh, system of free associations incorporating economic as well as social institutions would be what I refer to as anarcho-syndicalism, and it seems to me that it is the appropriate uh, form of social organization for an advanced technological society in which human beings do not have to be forced into the position of tools, of cogs in a machine. Since the 1960s, Noam Chomsky has been the voice of a very characteristic brand of rationalist libertarian socialism. He's attacked the abuses of power wherever he saw them, He's made himself deeply unpopular by his criticism of American policy. The subservience of the intelligentsia, the degradation of Zionism, the distortions of media and self-delusions in prevailing ideologies. Under the liberal administrations of the 1960s, the club of academic intellectuals designed and implemented the Vietnam War and uh, uh, other uh, similar, though smaller, actions. This particular community is a very relevant one to consider at a place like MIT because, of course, you're all free to enter, enter this community. In fact, you're invited and encouraged to enter uh, the community of 
technical intelligentsia and weapons designers and counterinsurgency uh, experts and pragmatic planners of an American empire is one that you have a great deal of inducement to uh, become associated with. The inducements, in fact, are very real. The rewards in power and affluence. Jamie. This came with the mail. Be with you in a second. Uh, oh god, they still got their cameras. Okay. Huh? I'll start. In your essay, Language and Freedom, you write, social action must be animated by a vision of a future society. I was wondering what vision of a future society uh, an animates you. Oh, well, I have my own ideas as to what a future society should look like. Uh, I've written about them. I mean, I think that we should, at the most general level, we should be seeking out forms of authority and domination and uh, challenging their legitimacy. Now, sometimes they are legitimate. That is, let's say, they're needed for survival. So, for example, I wouldn't suggest uh, that during the Second World War, uh, the, the forms of authority... We had a totalitarian society, basically, and I thought there was some justification for that under the wartime conditions. Uh, and there are other forms of... So, so for, uh, relations between parents and children, for example, involve forms of coercion, which are sometimes justifiable. Uh, but any such... Any, any form of coercion and uh, control requires justification, and most of them are completely unjustifiable. Now, at various stages of human civilization, it's been possible to challenge some of them, but not others. Others are too deep-seated, or you don't see them, or whatever. And so at any particular point, you try to detect those forms of authority and domination, uh, which, which are subject to change, uh, and which... Uh, uh, do not have any legitimacy, in fact, which often strike at fundamental human rights and your understanding of fundamental human nature and rights. Well, what are the major things, say, today? There are some that are being addressed, in a way. Uh, uh, the feminist movement is addressing some. The civil rights movement is addressing others. The one major one that's not being seriously addressed is the one that's really at the core of the system of domination, and that's private control over, uh, over resources. And that means an attack on the fundamental structure of state capitalism. And I think that's in order. That's not something far off in the future. Your life work. The alphabet has only 26 letters. With these 26 magic symbols, however, millions of words are written every day. Nowhere else are people so addicted to information and entertainment via the printed word. Every day the world comes thumping on the American doorstep and nothing that happens anywhere remains long a secret from the American newspaper reader. It comes to us pretty casually, the daily paper. But behind its arrival on your doorstep is one of journalism's major stories, how it got there. There is a standard view about democratic societies and the role of the media within them it's expressed, for example, by Supreme Court Justice Powell when he spoke of the crucial role of the media in affecting the societal purpose of the First Amendment, namely enabling the public to assert meaningful control over the political process. That kind of formulation expresses the understanding that democracy requires free access to uh, information and ideas and opinion, uh, and... Uh, uh, the same conceptions hold not only with regard to the media, but with regard to educational institutions, uh, publishing, uh, the intellectual community generally. It is basic to the health of a democracy that no phase of government activity escape the scrutiny of the press. Here, reporters are assigned to stories fateful not only to our nation, but to all nations. Congress, says the First Amendment, shall pass no law abridging the freedom of the press, and the chief executive himself throws open the doors of the White House to journalists representing papers of all shades of political opinion.
But it is worth bearing in mind that there is a contrary view. And in fact, the contrary view is very widely held and deeply rooted in our own civilization. Uh, it goes back to the origins of modern democracy, to the 17th century English Revolution, uh, which was a complicated affair like most popular revolutions. Uh, there was a struggle between parliament representing largely elements of the gentry and the merchants and the royalists representing other elite groups and they fought it out. But like many popular revolutions, there was also a lot of popular ferment going on that was opposed to all of them. There were popular movements that were questioning everything. The relation between master and servant, the right of authority altogether, all kinds of things were being questioned. Uh, there was a lot of radical publishing. The printing presses had just come into existence. And this disturbed all the elites on both sides of the Civil War. So as one historian pointed out at the time in 1660, uh, he criticized the radical Democrats, the ones we're calling for what we would call democracy, because they are making the people so curious and so arrogant that they will never find humility enough to submit to a civil rule. Now, underlying these doctrines, which were very widely held, uh, is a certain conception of democracy. It's a game for elites. Uh, it's not for the ignorant masses who have to be marginalized, uh, diverted, and controlled, of course, for their own good. Uh, the same principles were upheld in the American colonies. The dictum of the founding fathers of American democracy that, I'm quoting, the people who own the country ought to govern it. Uh, quoting John Jay. Ah! Now, in modern times, for elites, this contrary view about the intellectual life and the media and so on, this contrary view, in fact, is the standard one, I think, apart from rhetorical flourishes. From Washington, D.C., he's intellectual, author, and linguist, uh, Professor Noam Chomsky. Manufacturing Consent. What is that title meant to describe? Mm -hmm. Well, the title is actually borrowed from uh, a book by Walter Lippmann, written back uh, around 1921, in which he described what he called the manufacture of consent as a revolution in the practice of democracy. What it amounts to is a technique of control. Uh, and he said this was useful and necessary because uh, the common interests, the general concerns of all people, elude the public. The public just isn't up to dealing with them, and they have to be the domain of what he called a specialized class. Uh, notice that that's the opposite of the standard view about democracy. Uh, there's a version of this expressed by the uh, highly respected moralist and theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, who was very influential on contemporary policymakers. Uh, his view was that rationality belongs to the cool observer, but because of the stupidity of the average man, he follows not reason but faith. And this naive faith requires necessary illusion and emotionally potent oversimplifications, which are provided by the myth maker to keep the ordinary person on course. It's not the case, as the naive might think, that indoctrination is inconsistent with democracy. Rather, as this whole line of thinkers observes, it's the essence of democracy. The point is that in a military state or a feudal state or what we would nowadays call a totalitarian state, it doesn't much matter what people think because you've got a bludgeon over their head, then you can control what they do. But when the state loses the bludgeon, when you can't control people by force, and when the voice of the people can be heard, you have this problem. Uh, it may make people so curious and so arrogant that they don't have the humility to submit to a civil rule, and therefore you have to control what people think. And the standard way to do this is the resort to what in more honest days used to be called propaganda. Manufacture of consent, uh, creation of necessary illusions, various ways of either marginalizing the general public or reducing them to apathy in some fashion.
The oldest of two boys, Avram Noam Chomsky, was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1928. As a Jewish child, the anti-Semitism of the time affected him. Both parents taught Hebrew, and he became fascinated by literature, reading translations of French and Russian classics. He also took an interest in a grammar book written by his father on Hebrew of the Middle Ages. He recalls a childhood absorbed in reading, curled up in a sofa, often borrowing up to 12 books at once from the library. He is married to Carol, and they have three children. I don't like to impose on my wife and children a form of life that they certainly haven't selected for themselves, namely one of public exposure or exposure to the public media. That's their choice, and I don't believe that they have themselves selected this. I don't impose it on them. I would like to protect them from it, frankly. Uh, second, the sort of perhaps principal point is that I'm rather against the idea, the whole notion of uh, developing uh, public personalities uh, who are treated as uh, stars of one kind or another, where aspects of their personal life are supposed to have some significance and so on. Take one in the reception room. You said that you were just like us. You went to school, got good grades, and what made you start being critical, you know, and seeing them different? What started the change? You know what I mean? Well, you know, there are all kinds of personal factors in anybody's life. I mean, first of all, don't forget I grew up in a depression. parents actually happened to have jobs, which was kind of unusual. They were Hebrew school teachers, so sort of lower middle class. For them, uh, everything revolved around being Jewish, Hebrew and Palestine in those days and so on. And I grew up in that milieu, so you know, I learned Hebrew and went to Hebrew school, became a Hebrew school teacher, went to Hebrew college, led youth groups, uh, summer camps, Hebrew camps, the whole business. The branch of the Zionist movement that I was part of was all involved in socialist binationalism and Arab Jewish cooperation and all sorts of nice stuff. So, what did they think of you hopping on a train and you know, going up to New York and hanging out at anarchist bookstores on Fourth Avenue and talking to? Uh, I didn't mind you because uh, relatives there. I mean, I, I don't want to totally trust my childhood memories, obviously, but the family was split up. Like a lot of Jewish families, it went in all sorts of directions. There were sectors that were super orthodox. Uh, there were other sectors that were very radical and very assimilated and working class intellectuals. You know? And that's the sector that I naturally gravitated towards. It was a very lively intellectual culture. For one thing, it was a working class culture, it had working class values values of solidarity, socialist values, and so on. Uh, there was a sense somehow things were going to get better. An institutional structure was around the method of fighting, you know, of organizing, of doing things, uh, which had some hope. And I also had the advantage of having gone to a uh, experimental progressive school, to a Dewey school, which was quite good, uh, run by a university there. And, uh, you know, there was no such thing as competition. There was no such thing as being a good student. Uh, I mean, literally, the concept of being a good student didn't even arise until I got to high school. I went to the academic high school and suddenly discovered I'm a good student, you know, and I hated high school because I had to do all the things you have to do to get into college. But until then, it was kind of a free, uh, pretty open system. And I don't know, there are lots of other things. But maybe I just can't tank this. As a historian, I have read with interest and amazement your long review article of Gabriel Jackson's Spanish Civil War, and that's a very respectable piece of history, and I can appreciate how much work goes into that. When you know when I did that work? When did you then? I did that work in the early 1940s when I was about 12 years old. The first article I wrote was right after the fall of Barcelona in the school newspaper, and it was a, a lament about the, the rise of fascism in 1939. Actually, I guess one of the people who was the biggest influence in my life was an uncle who uh, had never gone past fourth grade. He was, you know, had a background in crime, and then left-wing politics, and all sorts of things. But he was a hunchback. 
and as a result, he could get a newsstand in New York. They had some program for people with physical disabilities. And some of you are from New York, I guess. Yeah, well, you know the 72nd Street kiosk? Yes. You know that? Right, that's where I, that's where I got my political education. At 72nd Street, there's a place where you come out of the subway, and there's, everybody goes towards 72nd Street. And there were two newsstands on that side, which were doing fine. And there's two newsstands on the back. And nobody comes out the back, you know. And that's where his news is. <laughs> but it was a very lively place. He was a very bright guy. It was the 30s. Uh, there were a lot of uh, emigres, you know, and so on. A lot of people were hanging around there. And in the evenings, especially, it was sort of a literary political salon. You know, every kind of guy is hanging around, arguing and talking. And as a kid, like I was 11, 12 years old, the biggest excitement was to work the newsstand. You write in Manufacturing Consent that it's the primary function of the mass media in the United States to mobilize public support for the special interests that dominate the government and the private sector. What are those interests? Well, if you want to understand the way any society works, ours or any other, uh, the first place to look is who makes, who is in a position to make the decisions that determine the way the society functions. Societies differ, but in ours, the major decisions over what happens in the society, decisions over investment and production and distribution and so on, are in the hands of a relatively concentrated network of major corporations and conglomerates and investment firms and so on. They are also the ones who staff the major executive positions in the government, and they're the ones who own the media, and they're the ones who have to be in a position to make the decisions. They have an overwhelmingly dominant role in the way life happens, you know, what's done in the society. Within the economic system, by law and in principle, they dominate. The control over resources and the need to satisfy their interests imposes very sharp constraints on the political system and uh, the ideological system. When we talk about manufacturing of consent, whose consent is being manufactured? We, we can, to start with, there are two different groups. We can get more into more detail, but at the first level of approximation, there's two targets for propaganda. One is what's sometimes called the political class. There's maybe 20% of the population, which is relatively educated, more or less articulate. Uh, they play some kind of role in decision making. Uh, they're supposed to sort of participate in social life, either as managers or cultural managers like say teachers and writers and so on they're supposed to vote they're supposed to play some role in the way economic and political and cultural life goes on now their consent is crucial it's one group that has to be deeply indoctrinated then there's maybe 80 percent of the population uh, whose main function is to follow orders and not to think you know and not to pay attention to anything. And they're the ones who usually pay the cost. All right. Professor Chomsky, no. Um, you outlined a model with filters that propaganda is uh, sent through. That's way to the public. Can you briefly outline those? It's basically an institutional analysis of the major media, what we call a propaganda model. We're talking primarily about the national media, those media that sort of set a general agenda that others more or less adhere to, to the extent that they even pay much attention to uh, national or international affairs. Now, the elite media are the sort of the agenda-setting media. That means the New York Times, the Washington Post, the major television channels, and so on. They set the general framework. The local media more or less adapt to their structure. World News. It sounds like it says that there's a beachhead. I think, I think, I think 628 is a good one. Yeah, but I think, I think, I think 6 is a good start. This is the operative sound by for us. He's, he's out. He really knows all the times. He's got a minute for all the time, so that's... I love this sound by. Okay, well, let's And they do this in all sorts of ways, by selection of topics, by distribution of concerns, by emphasis and framing of issues, by filtering of information, by bounding of debate within certain limits. Two and a half minutes to air. 45 seconds. They determine, they select, they shape, they control, they restrict uh, in order to serve the interests of dominant elite groups in the society. There is an unusual amount of attention focused today on the five nations of Central America. This is Democracy's Diary. Here for our instruction, 
are triumphs and disasters, the pattern of life's changing fabric. Here is great journalism, a revelation of the past, a guide to the present, and a clue to the future. The New York Times is certainly the most important newspaper in the United States, and one could argue the most important newspaper in the world. Uh, the New York Times plays an enormous role in shaping the perception of the current world on the part of the politically active, educated classes. Also, the New York Times has a special role, and I believe its editors probably feel that they bear a heavy burden in the sense that the New York Times creates history. What happened years ago may have a bearing on what happens tomorrow. Millions of clippings are preserved in the Times Library, all indexed for instant use, a priceless archive of events and the men who make them. That is, history is what appears in the New York Times archives. The place where people will go to find out what happened is the New York Times. Therefore, it's extremely important if history is going to be shaped in an appropriate way, that certain things appear, certain things not appear, certain questions be asked other questions be ignored, uh, and that issues be framed in a particular fashion. Now, in whose interests uh, is the history being so shaped? Well, I think that's not very difficult to answer. The process by which people make up their minds on this is a much more mysterious process than you would ever guess from reading manufacturing consent. There is a saying about legislation that legislation is like making sausage, uh, that the less you know about how it's done, uh, the better for your appetite. The same is true of this business. If you're in a conference in which decisions are being made on what to put on page one or whatnot, you would get, I think, uh, the impression uh, that uh, important decisions were being made in a flip and, and frivolous way. But in fact, given the pressures of time to try to get things out, you resort to a kind of a shorthand. And uh, you have to fill that paper up every day. Uh, it's curious in a kind of a mirror image way that uh, Professor Chomsky is in total accord with Reed Irvine, who at the right wing end of the spectrum says exactly what Chomsky does about the insinuating influence of the press, of the big media, as, quote, agenda setters, to use one of the great uh, uh, buzzwords of the time. And, uh, of course, Reed Irvine sees this as a left-wing conspiracy of foisting liberal ideas in both domestic and foreign affairs on the American people. But in both cases, I think that the premise really is an insult to the intelligence of the people who consume news. Now, to eliminate confusion, all of this has nothing to do with liberal or conservative bias. According to the propaganda model, both liberal and conservative wings of the media, whatever those terms are supposed to mean, fall within the same framework of assumptions. Uh, in fact, if the system functions well, it ought to have a liberal bias, or at least appear to, because if it appears to have a liberal bias, that will serve to balance thought even more effectively. In other words, if the press is indeed adversarial and liberal and all these bad things, then how can I go beyond it? They're already so extreme in their opposition to power that to go beyond it would be to take off from the planet. So therefore, it must be that the presuppositions that are accepted in the liberal media are sacrosanct, can't go beyond them. Uh, and a well-functioning system would, in fact, have a bias of that kind. The media would then serve to say, in effect, thus far and no further. Uh, we, we ask, what would you expect of those media on just relatively uncontroversial guided free market assumptions. And when you look at them, you find a number of major factors uh, entering into determining what their products are. Uh, these are what we call the filters. So one of them, for example, is ownership. Who owns them? The major agenda-setting media, after all, what are they? As institutions in the society, what are they? Well, in the first place, they are major corporations, in fact, huge corporations. Uh, furthermore, they're integrated with and sometimes owned by even larger corporations, conglomerates. So, for example, by Westinghouse and GE and so on. What I wanted to know was how specifically the elites control the media. What I mean is, I guess... It's like asking, how do the elites control General Motors? Well, why isn't that a question? 
I mean, General Motors is an institution of the elites. They don't have to control it. They own it. You know? Except, I guess, at a certain level, I think, um, like, I, I, I guess I work with student press, and I, and I, so I know, like, reporters and stuff. The, the and elites don't control the student press, but I'll tell you something. You try in the student press to do anything that breaks out of conventions, and you're going to have the whole business community around here down on your neck, and the, in, the university's going to get threatened, and, you know, I mean, depend, maybe nobody will pay any attention to you. That's possible. But if you get to the point where they can, don't stop paying attention to you, the pressures will start coming. Because there are people with power. There are people who own the country, and they're not going to let the country get out of control. What do you think about that? This is the, the, the old cabal theory that, uh, that somewhere there's a, there's a room with a baize-covered desk, and there are a bunch of capitalists sitting around, and they're pulling uh, strings. These rooms don't exist. I mean, I hate to tell Noam Chomsky this. You don't, you don't, you don't share that. I think it is the most absolute rubbish I've ever heard. This is the current fashion in the universities. You know, it's patent nonsense, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a nothing but a fashion. It's a way that uh, uh, intellectuals have of, of feeling like a clergy. I mean, there has to be something wrong. So what we have in the first place is major corporations, which are parts of even bigger conglomerates. Now, like any other corporation, they, they have a product which they sell to a market. Uh, the market is advertisers, that is, other businesses. What keeps the media functioning is not the audience. They make money from their advertisers. And remember, we're talking about the elite media, so they're trying to sell uh, a good product, a product which raises advertising rates and ask your friends in the advertising industry, that means that they want to mo adjust their audience to the more elite and affluent audience. That raises advertising rates. So what you have is institutions, corporations, big corporations, that are selling relatively privileged audiences to other businesses. Well, what point of view would you expect to come out of this? I mean, without any further assumptions, what you'd predict is that what comes out is a picture of the world, a perception of the world, that satisfies the needs and the interests and the perceptions uh, of the sellers, the buyers, and the product. Now, there are many other factors that press in the same direction. If people try to enter the system who don't have that point of view, they're likely to be excluded somewhere along the way. After all, no institution is going to happily design a mechanism to self-destruct. It's not the way institutions function. So they all work to exclude or marginalize or eliminate dissenting voices or alternative perspectives and so on because they're dysfunctional. They're dysfunctional to the institution itself. Um, do you think you've escaped the ideological indoctrination of the media and of the society that you grew up in? Have I? Mm -hmm. Often not. I mean, I, when I look back and think of the things that I haven't done that I should have done, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's very, uh, uh, it's uh, not a pleasant experience. So what's the story of young Noam in the schoolyard? Yeah, another. I mean, that was a personal thing for me. I don't know why it's interesting to anyone else, but I do remember. Well, you drew it. certain conclusions. Well, well, yeah, I mean, I, it had a big influence on me. I mean, I remember when I was about six, I guess, first grade. There was, there was the standard fat kid who everybody made fun of. And uh, I remember in the schoolyard, uh, he was on a, you know, standing on a, right outside the school classroom and a bunch of kids outside sort of taunting him and, you know, so on. And one of the kids actually brought over his older brother, sort of like from third grade instead of first grade, you know, big kid. And he was going to, you know, beat him up or something. And I remember going up to stand next to him, feeling somebody ought to, help him and I did for a while and then I got scared and I went away and I was very much ashamed of it afterwards and sort of felt uh, you know I'm not going to do that again. Uh, that's 
a feeling that's stuck with me. You, you should stick with the underdog. You know? And the shame remained, you know, should have stayed there. You were already established. You were a professor at MIT. You'd made a reputation. You had a terrific career ahead of you. You decided to become a political activist. Now, here is a classic case of somebody whom the institution does not seem to have filtered out. I mean, you were a good boy up until then, were you? Um, or you'd always been a slight, some of them you were a rebel? Yeah, pretty much. I had been pretty much outside. You felt isolated. You felt out of sympathy with the prevailing currents of American life. But a lot of people do that. Suddenly, in 1964, yeah. you decide, I have to do something That's about right. this. What made you do that? Well, that was a very conscious decision and a very Imagine. uncomfortable decision because I knew what the consequences would be. I was in a very favorable position. I had the kind of work I liked. We had a lively, exciting department. The field was going well. Personal life was fine. I was living in a nice place, children growing up. Everything looked perfect, and I knew I was giving it up. And at that time, remember, it was not just giving talks. I began involved right away in resistance, uh, and I expected to spend years in jail and came very close to it. In fact, my wife went back to graduate school in part because we assumed she's going to have to support the children. Uh, these were the expectations. And I recognized that if I returned to these interests, which were the dominant interests of my own youth, uh, life would become very uncomfortable. Because I know that the United States, you don't get sent to a psychiatric prison, and they don't send a death squad after you, and so on. But there are, uh, there are definite penalties for uh, breaking the rules. So these were real decisions. Uh, and it, it simply seemed at that point that it was just hopelessly immoral not to... Noam Chomsky. I'm a, on the faculty at MIT, and I've been uh, getting more and more heavily involved in anti-war activities for the last few years. Uh, beginning with uh, writing articles and making speeches and uh, speaking to congressmen and that sort of thing, and gradually getting involved more and more directly in uh, resistance activities of various sorts. I've come to the feeling myself that the most effective form of political action that uh, is open to a uh, responsible and concerned citizen at the moment is action that really involves direct uh, resistance, refusal to take part in what I think are war crimes, to raise the uh, domestic cost of American aggression overseas through uh, non-participation and a support for those who are refusing to that take part in particular draft resistance throughout the country. I think that we can see quite clearly some very, very serious defects and flaws in our society, our level of culture, our institutions, which are going to have to be corrected by operating outside of the framework that is commonly accepted. I think we're going to have to find new ways of political action. rejoice in your disposition to argue the Vietnam question, especially when I recognize what an act of self-control this must uh, involve. It does. Sure. It really does. Sure. I mean, I think and, that this is the kind of well. issue where, where well. you know, sometimes I lose my temper. Maybe not tonight. Maybe not tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because if you would, I'd smash you in the goddamn face. <laughs> the, uh, <clears throat> you say, you say in your book... reason for not losing my temper. <laughs> you say the war is simply an obscenity, a depraved act by weak and miserable men. Including all of us, including myself, well, including then, every... That's the next sentence, same yeah. sentence. Sure. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. sure, because you count everybody in the company of the guilty. I think that's true in this uh, case. Yeah. But See, then, one of the points I was trying... This is a sense of theological observation, isn't it? Uh, no, I don't think so. Because as somebody points out, if everybody's guilty of everything, then nobody's guilty of anything. No, I don't, well, <laughs> no, I don't, I don't believe that. See, I think that. I think the point that I'm trying to make, and I think ought to be made, is that the real... Uh, at least to me, I say this elsewhere in the book, the, what seems to me uh, a very, in a sense, terrifying aspect of our society and other societies is the equanimity and the detachment with which 
sane, reasonable, sensible people mm -hmm. can observe such events. I think that's more terrifying than the occasional Hitler or LeMay or other that crops up. These people would not be able to operate were it not for the, this apathy and equanimity. And therefore, I think that it's, in some sense, the sane and reasonable and tolerant people who, should, who, who share a, a very serious burden of guilt that they very easily throw on the shoulders of others who seem more extreme and more violent. Twelve million pounds of confetti dropped into New York City's so-called Canyon of Heroes. Americans were officially welcoming the troops home from the Persian Gulf War. So it worked out really great for us. I mean, uh, it just goes to show that we're a mighty nation and uh, we'll be there for no matter what comes along. I mean, it's the strongest country in the world and you got to be glad to live here. So tell me what you feel about uh, media coverage of the war. I guess it was good. It got to be a mu bit much after a while, but uh, I guess it was good to know everything, you know. I guess in Vietnam you didn't really know a lot was going on, but here you pretty much up to the, up to the moment on everything, so I guess it was good to be informed. For the first time because of technology, we have the ability to be live from many locations around the globe. And because of the format, an all-news network, we can spend whatever time is necessary uh, to bring the viewer the complete context of that day's portion of the story. And by context, I mean the institutional memory that is critical to understand why and how. And that's those who are analysts and do commentary uh, and those who can uh, explain. Slug that last piece. Um... I Israel post war. David Brinkley once said that you step in front of the camera and you get out of news business and into show business. But nonetheless, that should not in any way subtract or obscure the need for the basic standards of good journalism. Pat, hang tight. Let me give you a lead for Sally right now. Okay? Uh, President Bush and Prime Minister Major have, uh, have uh, closed uh, or have almost rejected uh, the Soviet uh, peace talk, peace efforts. Okay, in Saudi Arabia, the door is being left open. Uh, Rick Salinger is standing by live in Riyadh with the ladies. All but closed. Yeah, all but closed. Right. Accuracy, speed, a fair approach, an honesty and integrity within the reporter to try and bring the truth, whatever the truth may be. Uh, going to war is a serious business. In a totalitarian society, the uh, dictator just says, we're going to war, and everybody marches. And with this weapon of human brotherhood in our hands, we are seeing the war for men's minds not as a battle of truth against lies, but as a lasting alliance pledged in faith with all those millions driving forward to create the true new order, the world order of the people first, the people before all. In a democratic society, the theory is that if the political leadership has committed the war, they present reasons, and they got a very heavy burden of proof to meet because the war is a very catastrophic affair, as this one proved to be. Uh, the role of the media at that point is to uh, allow is to present the relevant background, for example, the possibilities of peaceful settlement, such as what they may be, have to be presented, and then to present, uh, to offer a forum, in fact, encourage a forum of debate over this very dread decision to go to war and, in this case, kill hundreds of thousands of people and leave two countries wrecked and so on. Uh, that never happened. Uh, the, there was never, uh, well, you know, when I say never, I mean 99.9% .9 of the discussion uh, excluded the option of a peaceful settlement. That Washington's Office of War Information calls one of the most vital and constructive tasks of this war. This is a people's war, and to win it, the people ought to know as much about it as they can. This office will do its best to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, both at home and abroad. The first weapon in this worldwide strategy of truth is the great machine of information represented by the free press with its powers of molding public thought and leading public action. With all its lifelines for the exchange of new ideas between fighting nations spread across the earth. 
And every time George Bush would appear and say there will be no negotiations, there would be, you know, 100 editorials the next day lauding him for going the last mile for diplomacy. Uh, if he said, uh, you can't reward an aggressor, instead of cracking up in ridicule the way people did in civilized sectors of the world, like the whole third world, uh, the media said, oh, man, a fantastic principle, you know. The invader of Panama, the only head of state uh, stands condemned for aggression in the world. The uh, guy who was head of the CIA during the Timor aggression, you know, he says aggressors can't be rewarded. The media just applauded. The motion picture industry, with its worldwide organization of newsreel camera crews, invaluable for bringing into vivid focus the background drama and perspectives of the war. Mobilized, too, in this all out struggle for men's minds are the radio networks, with all their experience in the swift reporting of great occasion and event. From every strategic center and frontline stronghold, their reporters are sending back the lessons of new tactics, new ways of war. The result was it's a media war. I mean, there's tremendous fakery all along the line. Uh, the UN is finally living up to its mission. You know, a wondrous sea change, the New York Times told us. The only wondrous sea change was that for once the United States didn't veto a Security Council resolution against aggression. People don't want a war unless you have to have one and they would have known that you don't have to have one. Well, the media kept people from knowing that. Uh, and that means we went to war very much in the manner of a totalitarian state, thanks to the media subservience. That's the big story. Now, remember, I'm not talking about a small radio station in Laramie. I'm talking about the national agenda-setting media. If you're on a radio news show in Laramie, chances are very strong that you pick up what was in the Times that morning and you decide that's the news. In fact, if you follow the AP wires, you find that in the afternoon, they send across tomorrow's front page of the New York Times. That's so that everybody knows what the news is. And the perceptions and the perspectives and so on are sort of transmitted down, and not to the precise detail, but the general picture is pretty much transmitted elsewhere. The foreign news comes here to the foreign news desk. The editor is Bob Hanley. Bob, I suppose you uh, get far more foreign news than you can possibly use in the paper. Yes, we do. We get a great deal more than we can accommodate in a day. And your, your job is to weed it out, I suppose. This is the selection center, as it were. And uh, when I have selected it, I pass it across the desk to one or the other of these sub-editors. It comes back to me, and on this chart, I design the page. That is page one and page two. Fine, Bob. Thank you very much. Why do you want to make a film about media? Well... Such a nice, quiet town. It's a beautiful town. <laughs> well, we're making a film about the mass media, so we thought, whatever, oh, yeah. what a good place you to come. You want to know where they got the name. So maybe you could start by introducing yourself. Yes, I'm Bowden Senko. I'm the Main Street Manager and the Executive Director of the Media Business Authority. And we are in Media, Delaware County, uh, in the southeastern part of Pennsylvania. Media is called Everybody's Hometown. The motto was developed as a way to promote the community. We're a very high promotion conscious community. When you walk through media, you'll be treated very well, and you find that people have taken the idea of being everybody's hometown to heart. The uh, local paper, the um, talk of the town. The town talk. <laughs> do you read that? Well, yes, I read the town talk, yes. What, what do you think the difference is between the Wall Street Journal and the, the talk? Oh, of the... well, I mean, the town talk is completely local news, and uh, it, it's fun, it's nice to read, it's interesting. You read about your neighbors and see what's going on in the school district and things like that. We're in business to make bucks, just like the big daily newspapers and just like the big radio stations, and we do quite well, and rightfully so, because we work very hard at it. I just want to show you a copy of the paper here, the way it is this week. It's, it's, it's plastic wrapped on all four sides, weatherproof, and hung on everybody's front door, and many, many times you'll find that this paper runs well over 100 pages a week this particular edition. You have to remember there are five editions. This happens to be the Central Delaware County edition, which is the edition that covers media Pennsylvania. What you see here now is the advertising and composition department. Say hello, guys, will you? Hi. Hi. Hi there. <laughs> uh, and what we're doing now is we're putting red dots, green dots, and yellow dots up on the map, wherever there is a store. Now, the red dots are the stores that don't advertise with us at all. 
the green dots are the ones that advertise with us every week, and the yellow dots are the ones that would run sporadically. Do you have any special now, we have computer printouts of every one of these stores, and what we do is we take the printouts of all the red dots, which are the bad guys, and what our idea is is to turn these red dots into yellow dots and turn the yellow dots into green dots and eventually make them all green dots so 100% of the stores and 100% of the merchants and the service people advertise in our newspaper every week. That way we won't have any more red dots. I guess there'll always be a few red dots, but I have high hopes that there'll be a lot more green ones or red ones when we're finished. Hi, I'm Jim Morgan. I'm with the Corporate Relations Department of the New York Times, and I'm here to take you on a tour of the New York Times, so let's begin. So, they're just taking audio uh, in here. Yeah, they're taking audio in here. Audio. No cameras, no still. We went over this quite thoroughly. They don't even take a still camera in here. We're in the composing room. This is where the pages are composed. This is the typographical area. What's the ratio of um, news to advertising? 60% ads. Um, this might seem uh, uh, big, but uh, it, it is average, in fact, below average. Our 60% might include, on some days, maybe uh, 20 pages of classified advertising all to itself, where the rest of the newspaper is weighted much heavier news to advertising. But the paper, in its entirety, every day, large or small, is 60 ads, 40 news. Well, that uh, completes our tour of the New York Times, and I hope you found it uh, informative, and uh, I hope uh, that you uh, read the New York Times uh, every day of your life from now on. Now, there are other media, too, whose basic social role is quite different. It's diversion. There's the, the real mass media, the kinds that are aimed at, you know, the guys who Joe Sixpack, that kind. The purpose of those media is just to dull people's brains. This is an oversimplification, but for the 80% or whatever they are, the main thing for them is to divert them, to get them to watch National Football League and to worry about, uh, you know, a mother with child with six heads or whatever you pick up in the, uh, you know, in the thing that you pick up on the supermarket stands and so on. Uh, or, you know, look at astrology or get involved in, you know, fundamentalist uh, stuff or something. Or just get them away, you know. Get them away from things that matter. Uh, and for that, it's important to uh, reduce their capacity to think. The sports section is handled in another special department. The sports reporter must be a specialist in his knowledge of sports. He gets his story right at the sporting event and often sends it into his paper play by play. Takes a sports. That's another crucial example of the indoctrination system, in my view. Uh, for one thing, because it, you know, it, it offers people something to pay attention to uh, that's of no importance. That keeps them from worrying about, you know, keeps them keeps them from worrying about things that matter to their lives that they might have some idea about doing something about. And in fact, it's striking to see the intelligence that's, that's used by ordinary people in sports. I mean, you listen to radio stations where people call in. They have the most exotic information and uh, understanding about, you know, all kind of arcane issues. And the press undoubtedly does a lot with this. I remember in high school already, I was pretty old, I suddenly asked myself at one point, why do I care if my high school team wins the football game? I mean, I don't know anybody on the team, you know. I, I, I mean, they have nothing to do with me. I mean, why am I cheering for my team? It doesn't mean it make any sense, you know. Uh, and, but the point is, it does make sense. It's a way of building up irrational attitudes of submission to authority and, you know, group cohesion behind, uh, you know, leadership elements. In fact, it's training in irrational jingoism. That's also a feature of uh, competitive sports. I think if you look closely at these things, I think they have, typically they do have functions. And that's why energy is devoted to supporting them and creating a basis for them and advertisers are willing to pay for them and so on. I'd like to ask you a question essentially about the methodology and studying the propaganda model and how would one go about doing that? Well, there are a number of ways to proceed. Uh, uh, one obvious way is to try to find more or less paired examples. Uh, history doesn't offer true controlled experiments, but it often comes pretty close. Uh, so one can find uh, uh, atrocities or abuses of one sort that on the one hand are committed by official enemies and on the other hand are committed by 
uh, friends and allies or by the favored state itself, by the United States in the U.S. case. And the question is whether the media accept the government framework or whether they use the same agenda, the same set of questions, the same criteria for uh, dealing with the two cases as any honest outside observer would do. If you think America's involvement in the war in Southeast Asia is over, think again. The Khmer Rouge are the most genocidal people on the face of the earth. Peter Jennings reporting from the killing fields, Thursday. I mean, the great act of genocide in the modern period is Pol Pot, 1975 to, through 1978. That atrocity, I think it would be hard to find any example of a comparable outrage and outpouring of fury and so on and so forth. So that's one atrocity. Well, it just happens that in that case, history did set up a controlled experiment. Have you ever heard of a place called East Timor? I uh, can't say that I have. Where? <laughs> East Timor? Nope. No, huh? Well, it happens that right at that time there was another atrocity, very similar in character, but differing in one respect. We were responsible for it, not Pol Pot. Hello, I'm Louise Penny, and this is Radio Noon. If you've been listening to the program fairly regularly over the last few months, you'll know East Timor has come into the conversation more than once, particularly when we were talking about foreign aid and also the war and a new world order. People wondered why, if the UN was serious about a new world order, no one was doing anything to help East Timor. The area was invaded by Indonesia in 1975. There are reports of atrocities against the Timorese people. And yet Canada and other nations have consistently voted against UN resolutions to end the occupation. Today we're going to take a closer look at East Timor, what's happened to it, and why the international community is doing nothing to help. One of the people who have been most active is Elaine Bruyere, a photojournalist from British Columbia. She's the founder of the East Timor Alert Network, and she joins me in studio now. Hello. Hi. One uh, tragedy compounding a tragedy is that a lot of people don't know much about East Timor. Where is it? East Timor is just north of Australia, about 420 kilometers, and it's right between the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Just south of East Timor is a deep water sea lane, perfect for U.S. submarines to pass through. There's also huge oil reserves there. One of the unique things about East Timor is that it's truly one of the last surviving ancient civilizations in that part of the world. The Timorese spoke 30 different languages and dialects amongst a group of 700,000 people. Today, less than 5% of the world's people live like the East Timorese, basically self-reliant. They live really outside of the global economic system. Small societies like the East Timorese are much more democratic and much more egalitarian, and there's much more sharing of power and wealth. Before the Indonesians invaded, most people lived in small rural villages. The old people in the village were like the university. They passed on tribal wisdom from generation to generation. Children grew up in a safe, stimulating, nurturing environment. A year after I left East Timor, I was appalled when I heard that Indonesia had invaded. They didn't want a small, independent country setting an example for the region. East Timor was a Portuguese colony. Indonesia had no claim to it, and in fact stated that they had no claim to it. During the period of colonization, uh, there was a good deal of politicization that different groups developed. A civil war broke out in August 75. ended up in a victory for Fredlin, uh, which was one of the groupings, described as populist Catholic in character with some typical leftish rhetoric. Indonesia at once started intervening. What's the situation? When did those ships come in? Uh, they started arriving since Monday. Six, seven boats together, very close to our border. No, they're not there just for fun, you know. Uh, they're preparing a massive operation. 
something happened here last night that moved us very deeply. It was so far outside our experience as Australians that we'll find it very difficult to convey to you, but we'll try. Sitting on woven mats under a thatched roof in a hut with no walls, we were the target of a barrage of questioning from men who know they may die tomorrow and cannot understand why the rest of the world does not care. That's all they want, for the United Nations to care about what is happening here. The emotion here last night was so strong that we, all three of us, felt we should be able to reach out into the warm night air and touch it. Greg Shackleton at an unnamed village which we'll remember forever in Portuguese Timor. Ford and Kissinger visited Jakarta, I think it was December 5th. We know that they had requested that Indonesia delay the invasion until after they left because it would be too embarrassing. And within hours, I think, after they left, the invasion took place on December 7th. What happened on December 7th in 1975 is just one of the great, um, great evil deeds of history. Early in the morning, bombs began dropping on Dili. The number of troops that invaded Dili that day almost outnumbered the entire population of the town. And for two or three weeks, there was just, they just killed people. And when I saw the fire, I put my hands on the ground. I put my hands on the ground. I just felt the body falling on me. It was like the leaves falling on me. And I was accompanied by gritos. Gritos. Others were called by the mother, the wife. It was really terrible. This council must consider Indonesian aggression against Timor as the main issue of the discussion. When the Indonesians invaded, the UN reacted as it always does, calling for um, sanctions and condemnation and so on. Various watered-down resolutions were passed, but the US was very clearly not going to allow anything to work. So the Timorese were fleeing into the jungles by the thousands. By late 1977-78, Indonesia set up receiving centers for those Timorese who came out of the jungle waving white flags. Those the Indonesians thought were more educated or who were suspected of belonging to Fredolin or other opposition parties were immediately killed. They took women aside and flew them off to Dili in helicopters for use by the Indonesian soldiers. They killed children and babies. But in those days, their main strategy and their main weapon was starvation. By 1978, it was approaching really genocidal levels. The church and other sources estimated about 200,000 people killed. Uh, the U.S. backed it all the way. The U.S. provided 90% of the arms. Uh, right after the invasion, arms shipments were stepped up. When the uh, Indonesians actually began to run out of arms in 1978, the Carter administration moved in and increased arms sales. And other Western countries did the same, Canada, England, Holland, and everybody who could make a buck was in there trying to make sure they could kill more Timorese. There is no Western concern for issues of aggression, atrocities, human rights abuses, and so on, if there's a profit to be made from them. Uh, nothing could show more, it more clearly than this case. It wasn't that nobody had ever heard of East Timor crucial to remember that there was plenty of coverage in the New York Times and elsewhere before the invasion. The reason was that there was concern at the time over the breakup of the Portuguese Empire and what that would mean. There was a fear that it would lead to independence or Russian influence or whatever. After the Indonesians invaded, the coverage dropped. Uh, there was some, but it was strictly from the point of view of the State Department and Indonesian generals, never a Timorese refugee. As the atrocities reached their maximum peak in 1978, when it really was becoming genocidal, coverage dropped to zero in the United States and Canada, the two countries have looked at closely, literally dropped to zero. All this was going on at exactly the same time as the great protest of outrage over Cambodia. The uh, level of atrocities was comparable. In relative terms, it was probably considerably higher in Timor. 
it turns out right in Cambodia in the preceding years, 1970 through 1975, there was also a comparable atrocity for which we were responsible. The major U.S. attack against Cambodia uh, started with the bombings of the early 1970s. They reached a peak in 1973, and they continued up till 1975. They were directed against inner Cambodia. Very little is known about them because the media wanted it to be secret. They knew it was going on, they just didn't want to know what was happening. The CIA estimates about 600,000 killed during that five-year period, which is mostly either U.S. bombing or a U.S.-sponsored war. So that's pretty significant killing. But also, the conditions in which it left Cambodia were such that high U.S. officials predicted that about a million people would die in the aftermath just from hunger and disease because of the wreckage of the country. Pretty good evidence from U.S. government sources and scholarly sources that the intense bombardment was a significant force, maybe a critical force, in building up peasant support for the Khmer Rouge, who before that were a pretty marginal element. Uh, well, that's just the wrong story. After 1975, atrocities continued, and that became the right story, because now they're being carried out by the bad guys. Well, it was bad enough. In fact, current estimates are that, well, you know, they vary. I mean, the CIA claimed 50 to 100,000 people killed and uh, maybe another million or so who died one way or another. Michael Vickery is the one person who's given a really close, detailed analysis. His figure is maybe 750,000 deaths above the normal. Others, like Ben Kiernan, suggest higher figures, but so far without a detailed analysis. Anyway, it was terrible, no doubt about it. Although the atrocities, the real atrocities, were bad enough, they weren't quite good enough for the uh, purposes needed. Within a few weeks after the Khmer Rouge takeover, the New York Times was already accusing them of genocide. At that point, maybe a couple hundred or maybe a few thousand people had been killed. And from then on, it was a drumbeat, a chorus of uh, genocide. The big bestseller on Cambodia, uh, Pol Pot, is called Murder in a Gentle Land. Up until April 17th, 1975, was a gentle land of peaceful, smiling people. And after that, some horrible holocaust took place. Very quickly, a figure of two million killed was hit upon. Uh, in fact, what was claimed was that the Khmer Rouge boast of having murdered two million people. The facts are very dramatic. Uh, in the case of atrocities committed by the official enemy, extraordinary show of outrage exaggeration, no evidence required, faked photographs are fine, anything goes. Also, a vast amount of lying. I mean, an amount of lying that would have made Stalin cringe. It was fraudulent, and we know that it was fraudulent by looking at the response to comparable atrocities for which the United States was responsible. Early 70s Cambodia, Timor, two very closely paired examples. Well, the media response was quite dramatic. Back in 1980, I taught a course at Tufts University. Well, Chomsky came around to this class. And he made a very powerful case uh, that the press underplayed the fact that the Indonesian government annexed this former Portuguese colony in 1975. And that if you compare it, for example, with Cambodia, where there was acreage of things, that this was a communist atrocity, whereas the other was not a communist atrocity. Well, I got quite interested in this, and I went to talk to the then deputy foreign editor of the Times. And I said, you know, we've had very poor coverage on this. And he said, you're absolutely right. There are a dozen atrocities around the world that we don't cover. This is one for various reasons. So I took it up. I was working as a reporter and writer for a small alternative radio program in upstate New York. And we received audio tapes of interviews with Timorese leaders. And we were quite surprised that given the level of American involvement, 
that there was not more coverage, indeed practically any coverage, of the large-scale Indonesian killing in the mainstream American media. We formed a small group of people to try to monitor the situation and see what we could do over time to alert public opinion to what was actually happening in East Timor. There were literally about half a dozen people who simply dedicated themselves with great commitment to getting the story to break through. And they reached a couple of people in Congress. Uh, they got to me, for example. I was able to testify at the UN and write some things. Uh, they kept at it, kept at it, kept at it. Uh, whatever is known about the subject is mainly comes from, essentially comes from their work. There's not much else. I wrote first an editorial called An Unjust War in East Timor. It had a map, and it said exactly what had happened. We then ran a dozen other editorials on it. They were read, they were entered in the congressional record, and several congressmen then took up the cause, and then something was done in Congress as a result of this. The fact that the editorial page in the New York Times on Christmas Eve published that editorial put our work on a very different level, and it gave a great deal of legitimacy to something that we were trying to uh, advance for a long time, and that was the idea and the reality that a major tragedy was unfolding in East Timor. If one takes literally uh, the various uh, uh, theories that uh, Professor Chomsky puts out, uh, one would feel that uh, there is a tacit conspiracy between the establishment press and the government in Washington to focus on certain things and ignore certain things, so that if we uh, broke the rules that we would instantly get a reaction, a sharp reaction from the uh, overlords in Washington who would say, hey, what are you doing speaking up on East Timor? We're trying to keep that quiet. We didn't hear a thing. What we did hear, and this was quite interesting, uh, is that there was a guy named Arnold Cohn, and he became a one-person lobby. I appreciate the nice things that Karl Meyer said about me in his interview, but I object to the notion that a one-man lobby was formed or anything like that. I think that if there weren't a large network composed of the American Catholic Bishops' Conference, composed of, of other church groups, composed of human rights groups, composed of simply concerned citizens and others, and a network of concern within the news media, I think that it would have been impossible to do anything at all at any time, and it certainly would have been impossible to sustain things for as long as they've been sustained. Professor Chomsky and a lot of people uh, who engage in this kind of press analysis have one thing in common. Most of them have never worked for a newspaper. Many of them know very little about how newspapers work. When Chomsky came around, uh, he had with him a file of all the coverage in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other papers of East Timor. And he would go to the meticulous degree that if, for example, the London Times had a piece on East Timor, and then it appeared in the New York Times that if a, if a paragraph was cut out, he'd compare and he'd say, look, this key paragraph right near the end, which is really what tells the whole story, was left out of the New York Times version of the London Times thing. There was uh, a story in the London Times, which is pretty accurate. The New York Times revised it radically and just leave the paragraph out. They revised it and gave it a totally different cast. It was then picked up by Newsweek, uh, giving it the New York Times cast. It ended up being a whitewash, whereas the original was an atrocity story. So I said to, to, to Chomsky at the time, I said, well, it may be that you're misinterpreting ignorance, haste, deadline pressure, etc., for some kind of determined effort to suppress an element of the story. He said, well, if it happened once or twice or three times, uh, I might agree with you, but if it happens a dozen times, Mr. Meyer, I think there's something else at work. And it's not a matter of happening one time, two times, five times, a hundred times. It happened all the time. I said, Professor Chomsky, having been in this business, it happens a dozen times, uh, that uh, these are very imperfect institutions. When they did give coverage, it was from the point of view of, it was, it was a whitewash of the United States. Now, you know, that's not an error. That's systematic, consistent behavior, in this case, without even any exception. This is a much more subtle process than, uh, than you get... Uh, uh, in the in the kind of the sledgehammer rhetoric of the people that uh, make a A to B equation 
between what the government does, what people think, and what newspapers say. Uh, that, uh, that sometimes what the Times does uh, can make an enormous um, uh, difference. At other times, it has no influence whatsoever. So um, one of the greatest tragedies of our age is still happening in East Timor. The Indonesians have killed up to a third of the population. They're in concentration camps. They conduct large-scale military campaigns against the people who are resisting. Campaigns with names like Operation Eradicate or Operation Clean Sweep. Timorese women are subjected to a forced birth control program. In addition, they're bringing in a constant stream of Indonesian settlers to take over the land. Whenever people are brave enough to take to the streets in demonstrations or show the least sign of resistance, they just massacre them. It's sort of like Indonesia, if we allow them to continue to stay in East Timor, the international community, they will simply digest East Timor and turn it into, they're turning, trying to turn it into cash crop. I mean, this is way beyond just demonstrating the subservience of the media to power. I mean, they are actual, they have real complicity in genocide in this case. Now, the reason that the atrocities can go on is because nobody knows about them. Uh, if anyone knew about them, there'd be protests and pressure to stop them. So therefore, by suppressing the facts, the media are making a major contribution to uh, some of the, probably the worst act of genocide since the Holocaust. You say that what the media do is to ignore certain kinds of atrocities that are committed by us and our friends mm -hmm. and to play up enormously atrocities that are committed by them and, and, and our enemies. And you posit that there's a test of integrity and moral honesty, which is to have a kind of equality of treatment of corpses. Equality of principles. Uh, I mean, that every dead person should be, in principle, equal that's to every, every other dead person. That's not what I say at all. Well, well, I'm glad that's not what you say, because, because in fact, that's not what you do. Of course it's not what I do. Nor would I say it. That's I mean, right. In fact, I say the opposite. What I say is that we should be responsible for our own actions primarily. Because your method is not only to ignore cor the corpses created by them, but also to ignore the corpses that are created by neither side, but which are irrelevant to your ideological That's agenda. totally untrue. Well, well let, let me give you an example. Okay. Um, that uh, that um, one, of your, one of your own causes that you take very seriously is the cause of the Palestinians. And, and a Palestinian corpse weighs, weighs very heavily on your conscience. And yet a Kurdish corpse does not. That's not um, true at all. I've uh, been involved in Kurdish support groups for years. Um, uh, uh, a That's absolutely true. That's absolutely false. I mean, just ask the Kurdish, ask the people who are involved in, I mean, you know, they come to me, I sign their petitions, and so on and so forth. And in and fact, you, if you look at the, stu at the things we've written, I mean, take, 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 let's take a look. I mean, I'm not Amnesty International. I can't do everything. I'm a single <laughs> person. But if you read, say, uh, take, take a look, say, at the book that Edward Herman and I wrote on this topic. In it, we discuss three kinds of atrocities, what we called benign bloodbaths, which nobody cares about, constructive bloodbaths, which are the ones we like, and nefarious bloodbaths, which are the ones that the bad guys do. The principle that I think we ought to follow is not the one that you stated. You know, it's, it's a very simple ethical point. You're responsible for the predictable consequences of your actions. You're not responsible for the predictable consequences of somebody else's actions. The most important thing uh, for me and for you is to think about the consequences of your actions. What can you affect? Uh, these are the things to keep in mind. These, these are not just academic exercises. We're not analyzing the media on Mars or in the 18th century or something like that. Uh, we're uh, dealing with real human beings who are suffering and dying and being tortured and starving uh, because of policies that we are involved in we as citizens of democratic societies are directly involved in and are responsible for and what the media are doing is ensuring that we do not act on our responsibilities and that the interests of power are served not the needs of the suffering people and not even the needs of the american people who would be horrified if they uh, realized the blood that's dripping from their hands because of uh, the way they're uh, allowing themselves to be deluded and manipulated by the system What about the third world? Well, uh, despite everything, and it's pretty ugly and awful, uh, these struggles are not over. The struggle for freedom and independence never is completely over.
Their courage, in fact, is really remarkable and amazing. I've personally had the privilege, and it is a privilege, of witnessing it a few times in villages in Southeast Asia and Central America and recently in the occupied West Bank, and it is astonishing to see. And it's always amazing, at least to me it's amazing, I can't understand it. It's also very moving and very inspiring. In fact, it's kind of awe-inspiring. Now, they rely very crucially on a very slim margin for survival that's provided by dissidence and turbulence within the imperial societies. And how large that margin is, is for us to determine. on the spot assignment we're going to see just what's behind the making of movies the director and the crew are shooting a documentary film let's take a closer look Bob uh, this word documentary uh, what would you say is the difference between a documentary film and a, a feature movie well there are a good many differences one would be length generally speaking documentaries are a good deal shorter than feature films also uh, documentaries have something to say in the way of a message they are informational films also, another term that's used interchangeably with documentary is the word actuality, actuality films. Bob, is this the thing you uh, hold up in front of the camera before each scene? This is a clapperboard, yes. This uh, identifies on the visual camera uh, the scene number and the take number, and also, as you heard, on the soundtrack. The editor back at the studio puts the two pieces of film together, matches where the lips of the clapper come together, and there you are in sync. Before the break, you were mentioning the media putting forth the information that the power elite want. I'm not sure if I understand, how does the power elite do this? And why do, why do we stand for it? Why does it work so well? Okay, well, I think here we have to, I mean, there, there are really two questions here. One, is this picture of the media true? And there you have to look at the evidence. I mean, I've given one example, and that shouldn't convince anybody. Uh, one has to look at a lot of evidence to see whether this is true. I think anyone who investigates it will find out uh, that the evidence to support it is simply overwhelming. In fact, it's probably one of the best supported conclusions in the social sciences. But the other question is, how does it work? I'm the, uh, I'm the media guy. You're the media. What would you like? I got you an International Herald Tribune. You want that? anything in you know, a Western language? Which doesn't mean that. What do you got? The Financial, Financial Times? Times? Absolutely. <laughs> the only paper that tells the truth. <laughs> you get the one uh, where they've been debating back and forth? NRC Handel's Blood. Handel's Blood. Okay, that's good. Well, this evening's uh, program is scheduled as a debate, which puzzled me all the way through. Uh, there are some problems. One problem is that no proposition has been set forth. As I understand debate, people are supposed to advocate something and oppose something. Uh, rather more sensibly, a topic has been proposed for discussion. Uh, the topic is manufacture of consent. It's somewhat unusual for a member of the government to debate with a professor in public. Uh, it hasn't happened in Holland before. I don't think it oft often happens elsewhere. Mr. Bulgestein, the floor is yours. Now, we all know that the theory can never be established merely by examples. It can only be established by, some, by showing some internal inherent logic. Professor Chomsky has not done so. Professor Chomsky? He's quite right when he says you can't just pick examples. You have to do them in a rational way. That's why we compared examples. The truth is that things are not as simple as Professor Chomsky maintains. Another of Professor Chomsky's case studies concerns the treatment that Cambodia has received in the Western press. Here he goes badly off the rails. <laughs> we didn't discuss Cambodia. We compared Cambodia with East Timor. 
two very closely paired examples. And we gave approximately 300 pages of detail covering this uh, in Political Economy of Human Rights, including a reference to every article we could discover about Cambodia. Many Western intellectuals do not like to face the facts and balk at the conclusions that any untutored person would draw. Many people are very irritated by the fact that we exposed the extraordinary deceit over Cambodia and paired it with the simultaneous suppression of the US-supported ongoing atrocities in Timor. That, people don't like that. Uh, for one thing, we were challenging the right to lie in defense of the state. For another thing, we were exposing the, act the apologetics and support for actual ongoing atrocities. That doesn't make you popular. Where did he learn about the atrocities in East Timor or in Central America? if not in the same free press which he so derides. You can find out where I learned about them by looking at my footnotes. I learned about them from human rights reports, from church reports, from refugee studies, and extensively from the Australian press. Uh, there was nothing from the American press because it was silenced. Chairman, this is an attempt at intellectual intimidation. These are the ways of the bully. <laughs> Professor Chomsky uses the oldest debating trick on record. He erects a man of straw and proceeds to hack away at him. <laughs> Professor Chomsky calls this the manufacture of consent. I call it the creation of consensus. In Holland, we call it draagvlak, which means foundation. Professor Chomsky thinks it is deceitful, but it is not. In a representative democracy, it means winning people for one's point of view. But I do not think that Professor Chomsky believes in representative democracy. I think he believes in direct democracy. With Rosa Luxemburg, he longs for the creative, spontaneous, self-correcting force of mass action. That is the vision of the anarchist. It is also a boy's dream. Uh, those who believe in democracy and freedom uh, have a uh, serious task ahead of them. What they should be doing, in my view, is dedicating their efforts to helping the despised common people to struggle for their rights and to realize the democratic goals that constantly surface throughout history. Uh, they should be serving not power and privilege, but rather their victims. Freedom and democracy are by now not merely values to be treasured, they are quite possibly the prerequisite to survival. It's a conspiracy theory, pure and simple. It is not borne out by the facts. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I have to go yes. to Amsterdam. If you'll excuse me, I'm leaving. <laughs> One thing is sure. Their consent has not been manufactured tonight. There is nothing more remote from what I'm discussing or what we have been discussing than a conspiracy theory. If I give an analysis of, say, the economic system and I point out that General Motors tries to maximize profit and market share, that's not a conspiracy theory. That's an institutional analysis. It has nothing to do with conspiracies. And that's precisely the sense in which we're talking about the media. The phrase conspiracy theory is one of those that's constantly brought up to, and I think its effect simply is to discourage institutional analysis. You think there's a connection somehow about what the government wants us to know and what the media tell us? It's not communism, but I think to a certain point, uh, it is sensitized. They don't always tell, I guess, John, they don't always tell the truth the way it goes, huh? Got that right. <laughs> I think that uh, the information you're getting from this, this paper is uh, biased in any way? Or? Oh, yeah. I think, by and large, it's, uh, it's uh, well done. Uh, you get both sides of the stories. You get the liberal and the side and the conservative side, so to speak. But I don't think you get a very balanced picture because they only have 20 seconds, 30 seconds for, for a news item or whatever, and they're going to pick out a highlight, and every network is going to cover the same highlight, and that's all you're going to see. You get uh, what you, they want you to hear. Do you think you're biased in some way then? Yeah. Here we go. See you later.
Is it possible for the lights to get a little brighter so I can see somebody out there? Yeah, for the last uh, hour and 41 minutes, you've been whining about how the elite and how the government have been using thought control to keep radicals like yourself out of uh, the public limelight. Now, uh, you're here. I don't see any CIA men waiting to drag you off. You were in the paper. They, that's where everyone here heard you were coming from, in the paper, and I'm sure they're going to publish your comments in the paper. Now, uh, a lot of countries, you would have been shot for what you have done today. So what are you whining about? This is, we are allowing you to speak, and I don't Fine. see any thought control. First of all, I haven't been saying, I haven't said one word about my, keep, my being kept out of the limelight. The way it works here is quite different. Now, I don't think you heard what I was saying, but the way it works here is that there is a system of shaping, uh, control, and so on, which gives a certain perception of the world. I gave one example. I'll give you sources where you can find thousands of others. That's, and it has nothing to do with me. It has to do with marginalizing the public and ensuring that they don't get in the way of elites who are supposed to run things without interference. In a review of the Chomsky Reader, it was written that as he's been forced to the margins, he's become strident and rigid. Do you feel this categorization of your later writings is accurate and that you've been a victim of this sort of process you've been describing? Well, the business about being forced to the... Uh, other people will have to judge about the stridency. I won't talk... I don't believe it, but anyway, that's for other people to judge. However, the matter of being forced to the margins is a matter of fact, and the fact is the opposite of what is claimed. Uh, the fact is it's much easier to gain access to even the major media now than it was 20 years ago. You've dealt in such unpopular truths and have been such a lonely figure as a consequence of that. Do you ever regret either that you took the stand you took, writ have written the things you have written, or that they, we had listened to you earlier? Uh, I don't. I mean, there are particular things which I would do differently because you think about things, you do them differently. But in general, I would say I do not regret it. I do mean, you like being controversial? No, it's a, no, it's a nuisance. Because this mass medium pays little attention to the views of dissenters, not just Noam Chomsky, but, but, but most dissenters do not get much of a hearing in this medium. No, in fact, that's, again, completely understandable. They wouldn't be performing their societal function if they allowed favored truths to be challenged. Now, notice that that's not true when I cross the border anywhere, so that I have easy access to the media in just about every other country in the world. There's a number of reasons for that. One reason is I'm primarily talking about the United States, and it's much less threatening. Your view there is that the military, militarization of the American economy essentially has come about because there are not other means of controlling a, the American population. In a democratic society. I mean, it may be paradoxical, but the freer the society is, the more it's necessary to resort to uh, devices like uh, induced fear. Okay, I'll go along with that. Arguably, he is the most important intellectual alive today. And if my program can give him 500,000 people listening or three quarters of a million people listening, I'll be delighted. Okay, Professor, and you're on time. Wartime planners understood that actual war aims should not be revealed. Uh, part of the reason why the media in Canada and in Belgium and so on are more open is that it just doesn't matter that much what people think. It matters very much what the politically articulate sectors of the population, those narrow minorities, think and do in the United States because of its overwhelming dominance on the world scene. But of course that's also a reason for wanting to work here. We might call the fifth freedom, the freedom to rob, exploit and dominate and to curb mischief by any feasible means. Let's conclude, not include. The United States is ideologically narrower in general than other countries. Furthermore, the structure of the American media is such as to pretty much eliminate critical discussion. Our guests are as far apart on the Contra question as American intellectuals can be. Now, if we had the slightest concern with democracy, which we do not in our foreign affairs and never have, we would turn to countries where we have influence, like El Salvador. Now, in El Salvador, they don't call the uh, archbishop bad names. What they do is murder him. They do, not, uh, repre they do not censor the press. They wipe the press out. They sent the army in to blow up the church radio station. The editor of the independent newspaper was found in a ditch, mutilated, and, and cut to pieces with don't, machete. Don't, don't, May I continue? I did well, not interrupt don't you. Don't ever want to put they, a time value they, on anything you say. Excuse, you want that to was 19, I'm, talk, I'm, talking, I'm talking about 1980. You are a systematic liar. 
Did these that, things happen or didn't they? Th these things did not happen in the context in which you suggested really? all. I, I, we, you we, are a phony, mister, and it's time that yeah. the people well, read you correctly. Uh, it's, it's clear, it's clear why you want to divert me from the discussion that no, I... No, it's not. Yeah, it's no, but let me get tired of rubbish. Uh, uh, but let's you continue given, with... Uh, uh, ex sorry. Except we can't. I'm afraid we're out of time. We thank you both, John Silver and Noam Chomsky. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Last time you were here, uh, you spoke about how when you go overseas, you are given access to the mass media. But here, that doesn't seem to be the case. Has that changed at all? Have you ever been invited to appear on uh, Nightline or Brinkley? Yes, I have a couple times been invited to speak on Nightline. I uh, couldn't do it. I had another talk and something or other. And to tell you the honest truth, I don't really care very much. FAIR, the media monitoring group, published a very interesting study of Nightline. It shows that their conception of a spectrum of opinion is ridiculously narrow, at least by European or world standards. Let me tell you a personal experience. I happened to be in Madison, Wisconsin, on a listener-supported radio station, community radio station, a very good one. I was having an interview with the news director. I've been on that program dozens of times, usually by telephone. And he's very good. He gets to all sorts of people. And he started the interview by playing for me a uh, tape of an interview that he had just had and had broadcast with the guy who's uh, some mucky muck in Nightline. I think his name is Jeff Greenfield or some such name. Is that name mean anything? I'm Jeff Greenfield for Nightline in New York. What about uh, just in the selection of guests to analyze things? Why is Noam Chomsky never on Nightline? I, I couldn't begin to tell you. He's one of the leading intellectuals in the entire world. I have no idea. I mean, I can make some guesses. Uh, he may be one of the leading intellectuals who uh, can't talk on television. You know, that's a standard that's very important to us. If you've got a 22-minute show, and a guy takes five minutes to warm up. Now, I don't know whether Chomsky does or not. Uh, he's out. One of the reasons why Nightline has the usual suspects is one of the things you have to do when you book a show is know that the person can make the point within the framework of television. And if people don't like that, they should understand it is about as sensible to book somebody who will take eight minutes to give an answer as it is to book somebody who doesn't speak English. But in the normal given flow, that's another culture bound thing. We've got to have English-speaking people. We also need concision. So Greenfield, or whatever his name is, hit the nail on the head. The U.S. media are alone in that, that it is, you must meet the condition of concision. You got to say things between two commercials or in 600 words. And that's a very important fact because the beauty of concision, you know, saying a couple of sentences between two commercials, the beauty of that is that you can only repeat conventional thoughts. I was reading Chomsky 20 years ago. I think his notion, he doesn't he have a, didn't he co-author a new book called Engineering Consent or The Manufacturing of Consent? Mm -hmm. I mean, some of that stuff to me looks like it's from Neptune. This is the first time the Neptune system has been seen clearly by human eyes. These pictures, taken only hours ago by Voyager 2, are its latest contribution. You know, he's perfectly entitled to say that I, I'm seeing it through a prism too. But my view of that, of, of his notions about the limits of debate in this country, is absolutely wacko. Suppose I get up on Nightline, say, and I'm given whatever it is, two minutes, and I say, Gaddafi is a terrorist, Khomeini is a murderer, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the Russians, you know, invaded Afghanistan, all this sort of stuff. I don't need any evidence. Everybody just nods. On the other hand, suppose you say something that just isn't regurgitating conventional pieties. Suppose you say something that's the least bit unexpected or controversial. Suppose you say, I mean, the biggest international terror operations that are known are the ones that are run out of Washington. Or suppose you say, what happened in the 1980s is the U.S. government was driven underground. Suppose I say the United States is invading South Vietnam, as it was. The best political leaders are the ones who are lazy and corrupt. If uh, the Nuremberg laws were applied, uh, then every post-war American president would have been hanged. The Bible is one of probably the most genocidal book in our total canon. Education is a system of imposed ignorance. There's no more morality in world affairs, fundamentally, than there was in the time of Genghis Khan. They're just different, you know, they're just different factors to be concerned with. Now, Chopsy, thank you. Well, you know, people will reason quite reasonably expect to know what you mean. Why did you say that? I never heard that before. 
Uh, if you said that, you better have a reason. You know, you better have some evidence. In fact, you better have a lot of evidence because that's a pretty st startling comment. Uh, you can't give evidence if you're stuck with concision. You know, that's the genius of these of this structural constraint. And in my view, if people like, say, Nightline and McNeil Lehrer and so on were smarter, if they were better propagandists, they would let dissidents on, let them on more, in fact. The reason is that they would sound like they're from Neptune. Then comes our special conversation on the Middle East crisis. Tonight's is with the activist, writer, and professor Noam Chomsky. Again, there is, has been an offer on the table, which we rejected, an Iraqi offer last April, okay, to, uh, to uh, uh, eliminate their chemical and other unconventional arsenals if Israel were to simultaneously do the same. Have to we end it there. It, but I think that should be pursued as well. Sorry to interrupt you. I have to end it there. That's the end of our time. Professor Chomsky, thank you very much for joining us. AT&T has supported the McNeil Era News Hour since 1983 because quality information and quality communications is our idea of a good connection. AT&T, the right choice. Oh, okay. okay. If you say, can you just sit there for half, half a second? It's just yeah. for two shots, that's all, and then we can do everything else with that. Okay. Yeah, what about the, uh, well, I better the mic? I, I, better I, I, better I think there's okay. some hanging around here. Right, the idea of this one is it's just a shot where I'm seen talking to you and you're seen listening to me. I'll ask you, though, if you don't speak to me or move your lips so that I can be seen to be asking you a question. The reason for the shot is simply this. I'm used to it. Okay, <laughs> just don't talk to me and I'll keep going. That's the thing. Uh, the reason for the shot, I'll explain it through because I usually find that's the easiest way to do it. The reason for the shot is I need a shot where you're sitting and seen listening to me while I'm asking you a question. We can use the shot to introduce you, explain who you are, where you fit into the piece I'm doing. But if you don't speak to me, I can also use... Got it? Okay, thanks for your time. Right out. If there is a narrow range of opinion in the United States, and it is harder to express a, a variety of, of different opinions, why do you live in the U.S.? Well, I think it's, well, first of all, it's my country, and secondly, it's in many ways, I, as I said before, it's the freest country in the world. I mean, I think there's more possibilities for change here than in any other country I know. But again, comparatively speaking, it's the country where the state is probably most restricted. But isn't that what you should be looking at comparatively rather yes, than in I absolute do. terms? But of you course. don't, you don't do. create that impression. On the well, maybe I don't give the impression. I certainly say it often enough. What I've said over and over again, and I've been saying it all tonight, I've written it a million times, is that the United States is a very free society. Uh, it's also a very rich society. Of course, the United States is a scandal from the point of view of its wealth. I mean, given the natural advantages that the United States has in terms of resources and uh, lack of enemies and so on, the United States should have a level of health and welfare and so on that's, you know, an order of magnitude beyond anybody else in the world. We don't. The United States is last among 20 industrialized societies in infant mortality. That's a scandal of American capitalism. And it ends up being a very free society, which does a lot of rotten things in the world. Okay? There's no contradiction there. I mean, you know, Greece was a free society by the standards of that of Athens, you know. It's also a vicious society from the point of view of its imperial behavior. There's virtually no correlation between the int maybe none, between the internal freedom of a society and its external behavior. Uh, you, you, you start your line of discussion at a moment that is historically useful for you. you that's the I say, grand you pick the, you fact pick the beginning. of you the post-war world right. is that the communist, communist imperialists, by the use of terrorism, by the use of by deprivation of freedom, uh, have contributed to the continuing bloodshed. And the sad thing about it is not only the bloodshed, but the fact that they seem to dispossess you of the power of rational may I, may I say something? Sure. Yeah. I think that's about 5% true, mm -hmm. and about, or maybe 10% true. It certainly is true. Why it, do you give that? Uh, may I complete a sentence? Sure. I mean, it's, it's perfectly true that there were areas of the world, in particular Eastern Europe, where, uh, where Stalinist imperialism uh, uh, very brutally uh, took control and still maintains control. But there are also very vast areas of the world where we were doing the same thing. And uh, there's quite an interplay in the Cold War. You see, the, what you just described is a, I believe, a mythology about the Cold War, which might have been tenable ten years ago, but which is quite inconsistent with contemporary scholarship. Ask a Czech. Ask, ask a Guatemalan, ask a Dominican, uh, re ask President of the Dominican Republic, ask, you know, ask a, uh, you don't, ask you, a person from well, South Vietnam, you know, ask yeah, a Thai. Well, obviously, say, we can't get away. If you can't distinguish between the nature of our uh, venture in Guatemala and the nature of the Soviet Union in Prague, What's then the we difference? have real difficulty. Well, explain, explain the difference. Sorry. Uh, now, what about making the media more responsive and democratic? Well, there are very narrow limits to that. It's kind of like asking, how do we make corporations more democratic? Well, the only way to do that is get rid of them, you know? I mean, if, if you have concentrated power, you can, I mean, I don't want to say you can do nothing. Like you can, you know, like the church can show up at the 
stockholders meeting and start screaming about not investing in South Africa. And sometimes that has marginal effects. I don't want to say it has no effect. But you can't really affect the structure of power because if you, I mean, to do that would be a social revolution. And unless you're ready for a social revolution, that is, power is going to be somewhere else, uh, the media are going to have their present structure and they're going to represent their present interests. Now, that's not to say that one shouldn't try to do things. I mean, it makes sense to try to push the limits of a system. It only takes one or two people that think they have integrity as journalists to give yeah. you some good press. See, that's important, and that goes back to something that came up before. I mean, there's a lot, you know, there are contradictions. You know, things are, con are complex. It's not monolithic. I mean, the mass media themselves are complicated institutions with internal contradictions. So on the one hand, there's the commitment to indoctrination and control. But on the other hand, there's the sense of professional integrity. She works alone as her own boss, writing newspaper columns and producing radio commentaries for a hodgepodge of small clients across the country. This so-called leather lung Texan has been firing questions at our chief executives for almost 40 years. And many a young man in this country is being disillusioned totally by his government these days. Well, this is a question which you very properly bring to the attention of the nation. It's not that we haven't been holding press conferences. I was just waiting for Sarah to come back. Mr. President, that's very nice of you, and I appreciate it. Sarah, I want to call your attention to a real problem we've got in this country today. Those unique and often terrifying McClendon questions reflect her desire to dig out information. And I want to ask your new man what he feels about <laughs> With enough know-how and persistence, she usually gets her man. What would you do if you were in a situation where you were trying to be an honest reporter and you were worried sick about your country, and you saw how sick it was, and uh, you were facing this weak White House and a weak Congress. Uh, as a reporter, what would you do? I think there are a lot of reporters who do a very good job. In fact, I have a lot of friends in the press who I think do a terrific job. What well, you I, I know they are, but I mean, they want to. But now, what, what well, you've you got, you have to, first, first, I mean, first of all, you have to understand what the system is. And smart reporters do understand what it is. You have to understand what the pressures are, what the commitments are, what the barriers are, and what the openings are. Like right after the Iran-Contra hearings, a lot of good reporters understood, well, things are going to be a little more open for a couple of months. So they could ram through stories that they knew they couldn't even talk about before. After Watergate. Uh, and, and the same after Watergate. And then, you know, it closes up again and so on. Most people, I imagine, simply internalize the values. Uh, that's the easiest way and the most successful way. You just internalize the values and then you regard yourself in a way correctly as uh, acting perfectly freely. All right, let's get to the White House now where I think veteran uh, correspondent uh, Frank Sesno could tell us a little bit about self-censorship. That, that, that uh, inertial guidance system is always going on, isn't it? Is there any formal censorship there? Well, there's no self-censorship, uh, Reed. If somebody tells me something, I'm going to pass it on unless there's a particular and compelling reason not to. I can't deny that I wouldn't like to have access to the Oval Office and all the same maps and charts and graphs that the president's looking at, but that's not possible, it's not realistic, and it's probably not even desirable. Hello. How are you? Fine. Can I sit down there, please? Yes. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Holland. I, uh, I'll introduce you first in a few lines. Uh, Professor Chomsky, Noam Chomsky, is nu 60 and is ongeveer the most uh, controversial intellectual of America. That is also a platitude, but so wordt hij nu eenmaal altijd genoemd. Chomsky has been called the Einstein of modern linguistics. The New York Times has said he's arguably the most important intellectual alive today. But his presence here has sparked a protest. This book that has, has poisoned the world and all liar in there. And as a Vietnamese people, we come here to warn the book. Vietnam! Vietnam! He said that in Vietnam there's no violation of human rights and no crime in Cambodia is wrong. Chomsky is using his professor. He using that to poison the world. And we, de we come here to protest that. I don't mind the denunciations, frankly. I mind the lies. Well, I mean, intellectuals are very good at lying. They're professionals at it. You know, vilification is a wonderful technique. There's no way of responding to it. If somebody calls you, a, you know, an anti-Semite, what can you say? I'm not an anti-Semite. You know, somebody says you're, you're a racist, you're a Nazi or something. There's, you always lose. I mean, the person who throws in the mud always wins yeah. because there's no way of responding to such charges. Professor Chomsky seems to believe that the people he criticizes fall into one of two classes, liars or dupes. Consider what happens when I discuss the case of Robert Faurisson. Let me recall the facts. 
uh, let's not go into details, please, because... The we details happen to be important. Yes, but I have only one question on the Foy Song question. Do the facts matter or don't they matter? They, of course they do. Well, yeah, let yeah. me tell you what the facts are. Uh -huh. Foy says that the, that the massacre of the Jews in the Holocaust is a historic lie. No. No, this is, an, this is an important one. It has a lot to do with the topic. Your views are extremely controversial, and perhaps one of the one of the things that has been most controversial and you've been most strongly criticized for was your defense of a, a French intellectual who was suspended from his university post for contending that there were no Nazi death camps in World War II. My name is Robert Forisson. I am 60. I am university professor in Lyon, France. Behind me, you may see the courthouse of Paris, the Palais de Justice. In this place, I was convicted many times at the beginning of the 80s. I was charged by nine associations, mostly Jewish associations, for uh, inciting hatred, racial hatred, for racial defamation, for damage by falsifying a story. Professor Chomsky and a number of other intellectuals signed a petition in which Fourisson is called a respected professor of literature who merely tried to make his findings public. Perhaps we can start with just the story of uh, Robert Fourisson and uh, your involvement. More than 500 people signed maybe 600, uh, mostly uh, universitaires, uh, scholars. And what happened to the other 499 of them? How come we only hear about Chomsky's signature? Well, I think it's because Chomsky is in himself a kind of political power. I signed a petition calling on the tribunal to defend his civil rights. At that point, the French press, which apparently has no conception of freedom of speech, uh, concluded that since I had called for his civil rights, I was therefore defending his theses. Forisson then published a book in which he tried to prove that the Nazi gas chambers never existed. What we deny is that there was an extermination program and an extermination, actually, especially in gas chambers or gas vans. The book contains a preface written by Professor Chomsky in which he calls Fourisson a relatively apolitical sort of liberal. A communist is a man, a Jew is a man, a Nazi is a man, I am a man. Are you a Nazi? I am not a Nazi. How would you describe yourself politically? Nothing. That you wrote, no, you no that's, it. that's not the preface that I wrote because I never wrote a preface, you and you know that I never wrote a preface. Yeah, we are, we done that uh, he's referring to a statement of mine on civil liberties, which was added to a book in which Florissant, excuse me. Yes, I use the language you use has meaning. That's right, and, and, the, and the language I use. A political liberal, or li as someone whose views can be dignified by the word findings or conclusions, that is a judgment, and that is a favorable judgment of oh, his views. Oh, on the contrary. Can I continue with the fact? <laughs> yes, are, you can continue with the facts for hours, but, but, but I mean, but, but there, there are, are a few facts that, yeah, okay. Let's get to the so-called uh, preface. Huh? Uh, I was then asked by the person who organized the petition yeah. to write a statement on freedom of speech, yeah. just banal comments uh -huh. about freedom of speech, pointing out the difference between uh -huh. defending a person's right to express his views and defending the views expressed. So I did that. I wrote a rather banal statement called Some Elementary Remarks on Freedom of Expression, mm -hmm. uh, and I told him, do what you like with it. So uh, Pierre produced a book which all the arguments of Florisson were to be put in front of the court. And we thought uh, wise uh, to use the text of Noam Chomsky as a kind of warning, a foreword, uh, to say that it was a matter of freedom of expression, freedom of thought, freedom of research. Why did you try at the last moment to get it back from that's the book? That's the one thing I'm sorry about. But the that's, the real, that's the no, real it's important not. thing. It's not. Of course. Because because the fact you, that I tried to retract because it. Because it, with that you said it was wrong of no, you I to didn't. do it. See, in fact, take a look at what I did. I wrote a letter 
which would mm. then publish those, in which I said, look, things have reached the point mm. where the French intellectual community simply is incapable of understanding the issues. Mm -hmm. At this point, it's just going to confuse matters even more if my uh, comments on freedom of speech happen to be attached to this book, which I don't, didn't know existed. So just to clarify things, you better separate them. Now, in retrospect, I think I probably shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. I should have just said, fine, then let it appear, because it ought to appear. Mm -hmm. But that's, uh, apart from that, uh, I regard this as not only trivial, but as compared with other positions I've taken on freedom of speech, invisible. I do not think that the state ought to have the right to determine historical truth and to punish people who deviate from it. I'm not willing to give the state that right, even if they happen to... But are you denying that the gas chambers ever First existed? Not. But I'm saying, if you believe in freedom of speech, you believe in freedom of speech for views you don't like. I mean, Goebbels was in favor of freedom of speech for views he liked, right? So was Stalin. If you're in favor of freedom of speech, that means you're in favor of freedom of speech precisely for views you despise. Otherwise, you're not in favor of freedom of speech. There's two positions you can have on freedom of speech. Now, you can decide which position you want. With regard to my defense of the utterly offensive, the, the, the people who express utterly offensive views, I have the slightest doubt that every commissar says, you're defending that person's views. No, I'm not. I'm defending his right to express them. The difference is crucial, and the difference has been understood outside of fascist circles since the 18th century. Is there anything like objectivity, or yeah. scientific objectivity, reality, as a scientist? Yeah, look, I'm not saying I defend the views. I, look, if, if, if somebody publishes a scientific article, which I disagree with, I do not say the state ought to put him in jail. Right? All right, but you don't have to support him right away and say, you know, him. I support no, him just oh, no. for the sake of yeah, everybody but, saying that fine, whatever but suppose, he wants to say. Suppose this guy is taken to court and charged with falsification then I'm going to defend them, even right. if I disagree. But he and that's wasn't what taken to court. Oh, you're wrong. But, they, but when did you write the support? I mean, did when you he was brought to court. Do you support and in him? fact, the only support that I gave him is to say he has a right of freedom of speech, period. There is no doubt in my mind that the example that I gave about the story is the Holocaust that did not exist is very, very typical. Uh, how, how much I'll give you another the, example about how, the how much of the American press believes the that Florissant has anything to say, or oh. any press? How okay. much of the press in France? Since I follow, what percentage since, would you say? I'll tell you. Is it, is it higher than zero? I don't know. I tell is it higher you, than I'll zero? Tell you, I'll tell you. Have okay. you ever seen anything in any newspaper or any journal I'll try to saying answer. that this man is anything other than okay. a lunatic? I'll try to answer. Okay. I'll try to answer. I think that uh, I just follow the That's case. That's a simple question. I followed the case five or six years ago, and mm -hmm. I happened to see that uh, Noam Chomsky was in for strong criticism, even from some of his supporters, for doing something which could be interpreted only in terms of a campaign against Israel. Going back years, I am absolutely certain that I've taken far more extreme positions on people who deny the Holocaust than you have. For example, you go back to my earliest articles and you'll find that I say that even to enter into the arena of debate on the question of whether the Nazis carried out such atrocities is already to lose one's humanity. So I don't even think you ought to discuss the issue if you want to know my opinion. But if anybody wants to refute Faurisson, there's certainly no difficulty in doing so. I'm, I'm not interested in, in uh, freedom of speech and all that. I have to win. And that's the question. And I shall win. I'm, I'm just an ordinary mom who just thinks in terms of I don't want to someday be holding my grandchildren and watching something horrible happen and feel like I didn't do anything. And I mean, it's obvious what, what you're doing. And my question is, on a practical level, where do you see the most practical place to put your energy? I mean, tonight I feel in overwhelm, like I feel like it's too big, it's too much to, to even make a dent in. The way things change is because lots of people are working all the time. And, you know, they're working in their communities, in their workplace, or wherever they happen to be, and they're building up the basis for popular movements which are going to make changes. 
that's the way everything has ever happened in history, you know, whether it was the end of slavery or uh, whether it was uh, the democratic revolutions or anything you want, you name it, that's the way it worked. Uh, you get a very false picture of this from the history books. In the history books, there's a couple of leaders, uh, you know, George Washington or Martin Luther King or whatever. And I don't want to say that those people are unimportant, like Mar Martin Luther King was certainly important, but he was not the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King can appear in the history books because lots of people whose names you will never know and whose names are all forgotten and who may have been killed and so on were working down in the South. When you have uh, active activists and people concerned and people devoting themselves and dedicating themselves to social change or issues or whatever, then uh, people like me can appear and we can appear to be prominent. But that's only because somebody else is doing the work. My work, uh, whether it's uh, giving hundreds of talks a year or spending 20 hours a week writing letters or writing books, is not directed to uh, uh, intellectuals and politicians. It's directed to what are called ordinary people. Yeah. Uh, and what I uh, expect from them is, in fact, exactly what they are, that they should uh, try to understand the world and act in accordance with their decent impulses. Uh, and that they should try to improve the world. And many people are willing to do that, but they have to understand. And in fact, as far as I can see, in, in these things, mm -hmm. I feel that I'm simply helping people develop uh, courses of intellectual self-defense. What did you mean by that? What, what would such a course well, be? I don't mean go to school, because you're not going to get it there. Uh, it means uh, you have to develop an independent mind and work on it. Now, that's extremely hard to do alone. You know? The, the beauty of our system is it isolates everybody. Each person is sitting alone in front of the two. You know? now, it's very hard to have ideas or thoughts under those circumstances. You can't fight the world alone. You know? uh, some people can, but it's pretty rare. The way to do it is through organization. So courses of intellectual self-defense will have to be in the context of political and other organization. And it makes sense, I think, to look at what the institutions are trying to do and to take that almost as a key. What they're trying to do is what we're trying to combat. If they're trying to keep people isolated and separate and, uh, you know, uh, and so on, well, we're trying to do the opposite. We're trying to bring them together. So in your local community, you want to have uh, sources of alternative action. People with parallel concerns may be differently focused, but at the core, sort of similar values and a similar interest in helping people learn how to defend themselves against external power and taking control of their lives and, you know, reaching out your hand to people who need it. That's a common array of concerns. You can learn about your own values and you can figure out how to defend yourself and so on in conjunction with others. Um, are there one or two publications that I, as an average person, a biologist, can read to bypass this filter of our, par mm -hmm. of our press? Now, if you ask what media can I turn to to get the right answers, first of all, I wouldn't tell you that because I don't think there's an answer. The right answers are what you decide are the right answers. Maybe everything I'm telling is wrong, okay? Could perfectly well be, I'm the God. But that's nothing for you to figure out. I mean, I could tell you what I think happens to be more or less right, but there isn't any reason why you should pay any attention to it. What impact do you feel alternative media is currently having or could potentially have? I'm actually a little more interested in its potential. potential. And uh, just to define my terms, by alternative media, I'm referring to media that are or could be citizen controlled as opposed right. to state or corporate right. control. Right. You know, that's what's kept people together. To the extent that people are able to do something constructive, it's because they have some way of interacting. I mean, I've always felt it would be a very positive thing, and it should be pushed as far as it can go. Uh, I think it's going to have a very hard time. Uh, there's just such a concentration of resources and power that uh, uh, alternative media, while extremely important, are uh, going to have quite a battle. It's true there are things which are small successes, but it's because people have just been willing to put in incredible effort. Like, say, take Z Magazine. I mean, that's a national magazine which literally has a staff of two and no resources. Tell us a little about Z Magazine, what it is and what makes it different. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We just wanted to do a magazine that would address all the sides of political life, economics, race, gender, authority, political relations. 
and we wanted to do it in a way that would incorporate an attention to how to not only understand what's going on, but how to make things better, what to aim toward, and uh, to provide at the same time humor, culture, a kind of a magazine that people could relate to and could get a lot out of and could participate in. And what we wanted to do, which we didn't think was provided by the existing magazines, was to give it a real activist slant so that it could be very useful to the variety of uh, movements in the country. And we just felt there wasn't a magazine that reflected that, that inspired people and that gave people sort of a, a strategy and perhaps even a vision of how things could be better. South End Press has sort of made it. Now, that is, they're surviving. It's a small collective, again, with no resources, and they put out a lot of books, including quite a lot of good books. But for a South End book to get reviewed is almost impossible. Editorially and um, business-wise, we make decisions based on um, a politics that no corporate publisher can really um, advocate because of their ties to corporate America. We can solicit manuscripts based on what we feel is the relevance for the movement. And we can make our business decisions based on whether we feel people can afford our books, whether we feel that a book uh, might not make that much money, but it needs to be out there, and maybe there is a 1,000 people who would buy it. And those are criteria that we feel are very precious in this day of, of corporate mergers. Well, and likewise, our structure about sharing work and continuing our training process as long as we're at the press, there are losses there in terms of productivity. But in terms of empowerment, all of us are then able to say, my perspective is different from yours. Then all of our intelligence gets used in making those decisions, and not just whoever happens to have done it the longest, whoever happens to uh, have graduated from the best schools in order to be the best editor, making all the decisions and only using his or her intelligence. The well, Sinister Party Radio in the United States has undergone a remarkable growth in the last decade. Uh, it's perhaps the fastest growing alternative media. Uh, there are many reasons for this. Uh, first and foremost is that it's enormously economical and it reaches communities that have not been served by community radio before. And in Boulder in particular, we see with someone like uh, Noam Chomsky, who's been there, I believe, three times in the last six years, uh, he has a tremendous audience. And KGNU is partly responsible for that because we play his tapes on a regular ba basis. We play his lectures and his interviews. So when he does come to Boulder and people hear what he has to say, they're able to tune in. It's not something exotic or esoteric that he's talking about. It's material that they're very familiar with. And he's noted this, incidentally. I mean, if there's a listener-supported radio station, you're, that means that people can get daily, every day, a different way of looking at the world, not just what the corporate media want you to see, but a different picture, a different understanding. Not only can you hear it, but you can participate in it. You can add your own thoughts, you know, and you can learn something and so on. Well, that's the way uh, people become uh, human, you know. That's the way you become human participants in a in a social and political system. Hello, I'm Ed Robinson, and this is Non-Corporate News. What is Non-Corporate News, and why is it necessary? I didn't want to just show another film at a library or something. I wanted to make my own statement. I thought it would be more fun to do, and perhaps I could get other people involved in a, in a project besides showing a film. We could, we could make a film or a video. The local cable station is hooked up to three communities, Lynn, Swampscott, and Salem. So that's 30,000 people, it, or 30,000 homes, I'm not sure, but I'm sure a lot of people will see it, and it'll be the kind of people who don't go out to, to see a film. It'll go right into their houses, so if they're flipping through the channels, they might be able to get a completely new idea of the world. So there's kind of networks of cooperation developed which, I mean, like here, for example, is a collection of stuff from a friend of mine in Los Angeles who uh, does careful monitoring of the whole press in Los Angeles and a lot of the British press, which he reads, uh, and uh, sele does selection, so I don't have to read the, you know, the movie reviews and the local gossip and all this kind of stuff, but I get the occasional nugget that sneaks through and that you find if you're carefully and intelligently and critically 
reviewing a wide range of press. Well, there are a fair number of people who do this, and we exchange information. We wrote this a two-volume work in which we saw one another for a couple weeks when we were getting started, but then we wrote two volumes, essentially, without seeing one another, just uh, by phone, by, by mail, and uh, exchanging manuscripts. And, but this takes a lot of, a lot of uh, communication by mail. My, my Chomsky file is a couple of feet thick. The end result is that you do have access to resources in a way which I doubt that any national intelligence agency can duplicate a little on scholarship. So there are ways of compensating for the uh, absence of resources. People can do things. Like, for example, I found out about the arms flow to Iran by reading transcripts of the BBC. Uh, and by reading uh, an interview somewhere with an Israeli ambassador in one city and reading something else in the Israeli press. Now, okay, the information is there, mm. but it's there to a fanatic, you know, somebody who mm. wants to uh, spend a substantial part of their time and energy exploring it and comparing today's lies with yesterday's leaks and so on. That's a research mm -hmm. job. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it just simply doesn't make any sense to ask the uh, general population to dedicate themselves to this task on every issue. I'm not given the false modesty. There are mm. things that I can do, and I mm. know that I can do them reasonably well, uh, including uh, uh, analysis mm. and uh, you know, uh, uh, study, research. I mean, I know how to do that sort yeah. of thing, and I think I have a reasonable understanding of the way the world uh, works as much as anyone can. Yeah. And that turns out to be a very useful resource for people who are uh, uh, who are doing active organizing, uh, 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 trying to uh, engage themselves in a way which will make it a little bit of a better world. And if you can help in those things or participate in them, well, that's, uh, you know, that's rewarding. I wonder if you can envision a time when people uh, like myself, uh, again, the naive people of this world, can again take pride in the United States. And is that even a healthy dis wish now? Because it may be this hunger uh, for pride in our country that makes us more easily manipulated by the powers that you talk about. Uh, I think you first of all have to ask what you mean by your country. Now, if you mean by the country, the government, I don't think you can be proud of it, and I don't think you could ever be proud of it. Or it could you be proud of any government. It's not our government. You know. uh, and you shouldn't be. States are violent institutions. They, the government of any country, including ours, represents some sort of domestic power structure, and it's usually violent. States are violent to the extent that they're powerful. That's roughly accurate. You look at American history, it's nothing to write home about. You know, why are we here? We're here because, say, some 10 million Native Americans were wiped out. That's not very pretty. Until the 1960s, it was still cowboys and Indians. In the 1970s, for the first time, really, it became possible even for scholarship to try to deal with the facts as they were. For example, to deal with the fact that the Native American population was far higher than had been claimed, millions higher, maybe as many as 10 million higher than had been claimed, and that they had an advanced civilization, and that there was something akin to genocide that took place. Now, we went through 200 years of our history without facing that fact. Uh, one of the effects of the 1960s is it's possible to at least begin to come to, to think about the facts. Well, that's an advance. Do you think that this activism 20 years ago has made a, a difference in how our society operates now? Uh, it has not changed the institutions and the way they function. But it has led to very significant cultural changes. Uh, remember, these movements of the 60s uh, expanded in the 70s and expanded further in the 80s, and they reached into other parts of the society and different issues. Uh, these, uh, a, a lot of things that seemed uh, outrageous in the 60s are taken for granted today. Uh, so, for example, take the feminist movement, for example, which barely began to exist in the 60s. Now it's part of general consciousness and awareness. Uh, the uh, ecological movements began in the 70s. Uh, the solidarity, third world solidarity movements were very limited in the 60s. It was really Vietnam. Uh, and uh, in the 60s also it was a student movement, as you say. Now it's not. Now it's mainstream America. If there is more dissidence now than you can remember, why do you go on to write that the people feel isolated? Because I think much of the general population recognizes that the organized institutions do not reflect their concerns and interests and needs. 
They do not feel that they participate meaningfully in the political system. They do not feel that the media are telling them the truth or even reflect their concerns. Uh, they go outside of the organized institutions to act. We see more and more of our elected leaders and know less and less of what they're doing. Yeah. Fact, this medium does that. Very striking. In fact, the, the presidential elections have been almost removed from the point where the public even takes them seriously as involving a matter of choice. So what do you think about what goes on in the White House? It's kept too <laughs> private, I think. Yeah, they should come out. Talk I know. To the people. Yeah. Who should talk to the people? Yeah. George, George Bush. Bush. <laughs> well, it means that the political system increasingly increasingly functions without public input. Uh, it means to an increasing extent not only do people not ratify decisions presented to them, but they don't even take the trouble of ratifying them. They assume that the decisions are going on independently of what they may do in the polling booth. Ratification would, have, would be what? Well, ratification would mean a system in which there are two positions presented to me, the voter. I go into the polling booth and I push one or another button depending on which of those positions I want. That's a very limited form of democracy. Really meaningful democracy would mean that I play a role in forming those decisions and making, creating those positions. And that would be real democracy. That's not we're very far from that. But we're even departing from the point where there is ratification. When you have stage-managed elections uh, with the public relations industry determining what words come out of people's mouth, candidates decide what to say on the basis of tests that determine what the effect will be across the population. Somehow people don't see how profoundly contemptuous that is of democracy. The solemn moment is near, but first, the swearing in of Van Quayle. Please move to your seats. For the first time in this century, for the first time in perhaps all history, Man does not have to invent a system by which to live. We don't have to talk late into the night about which form of government is better. We don't have to wrest justice from the kings. We only have to summon it from within ourselves. This is a time when the future seems a door you can walk right through into a room called tomorrow. Great nations of the world are moving toward democracy through the door to freedom. The people of the world agitate for free expression and free thought through the door to the moral and intellectual satisfactions that only liberty allows. We know how to secure a more just and prosperous life for man on earth through free markets, free speech, free elections, and the exercise of free will unhampered by the state. I've spoken at a thousand points of light of all the community organizations that are spread like stars throughout the nation doing good. To the world, too, we offer new engagement and a renewed vow. We will stay strong to protect the peace. The offered hand is a reluctant fist. America is never wholly herself unless she is engaged in high moral principle. We as a people have such a purpose today. It is to make kinder the face of the nation and gentler the face of the world. Referring back to your earlier comment about uh, escaping from or doing away with capitalism, I was wondering what scheme, workable scheme, you would put in its place. Me? Or uh, well, what I would, <laughs> yeah. what, well, what you would know, you I, suggest to others who might be in a position yeah. to set it up and get it going? Well, I mean, I, I think that uh, what used to be called centuries ago wage slavery is intolerable. I mean, I don't think people ought to be forced to rent themselves in order to survive. I think that the economic institutions ought to be run democratically by their participants, by the communities in which they exist, and so on. And uh, I think basically through various kinds of free association. Historically, have there been any uh, sustained examples on any substantial scale of uh, societies which approximated to the anarchist ideal? There are small societies, uh, small in number, that have, I think, done so quite well, and there are 
a few examples of large-scale uh, libertarian revolutions, which were largely anarchist in their structure. Uh, as to the first, small societies ex extending over a long period, I myself think the most dramatic example is uh, perhaps the Israeli kibbutzim, uh, which for a long period, may or may not be true today, really were constructed on anarchist principles, that is, of direct worker control, integration of agriculture, industry, service, personal life, on an egalitarian basis with direct and, in fact, quite active participation in, in self-management, and were, I should think, extraordinarily successful. A good example of a really large-scale anarchist revolution, or largely anarchist revolution, in fact, the best example, to my knowledge, is the Spanish Revolution in 1936. And, in fact, uh, you can't tell what would have happened. That anarchist revolution was simply destroyed by force, but during the period in which it was alive, I think it was uh, inspiring testimony to the ability of uh, poor working people to uh, organize, manage uh, their affairs extremely successfully without coercion and control. How far does the success of uh, libertarian socialism or anarchism as a way of life really depend on a fundamental change in the nature uh, of man, both in his motivation, his altruism, and also in his knowledge and sophistication? I think it not only depends on it, but in fact the whole purpose of libertarian socialism is that it will contribute to it. Uh, it will contribute to a spiritual transformation. Precisely that kind of great transformation in, uh, in the way humans conceive of themselves and their uh, ability to act, to decide, to create, to produce, to inquire. Precisely that spiritual transformation that uh, social thinkers from the left Marxist tradition, from Lex Luxembourg, say, on over through anarcho-syndicalists have always emphasized. So, on the one hand, it requires that spiritual transformation. On the other hand, the, its purpose is to create institutions which will contribute to that transformation. You've written that in looking at contributions of gifted thinkers, one must make sure to understand their contributions, but also to eliminate the errors in them. Um, and of your ideas, what would you guess would be discarded and what would be assimilated by future thinkers? Well, I mean, I would assume virtually everything would be discarded. Uh, for example, in, uh, here, here we have to distinguish. I mean, the work that I do in my professional area, I mean, if I still believed what I believed 10 years ago, I'd assume the field is dead. Uh, so I assume that when next time you read a student's paper, you're going to see something that has to be changed and you continue to make progress. In dealing with social and political issues, in my view, what is at all understood is pretty straightforward. I don't think that there, there may be deep and complicated things, but if so, they're not understood. Uh, the, uh, uh, the basic ways, to the extent that we understand society at all, it's pretty straightforward. And I don't think that those simple understandings are likely to undergo much change. Uh, the point is that you have to work. And that's why, that's why the propaganda system is so successful. Uh, very few people are going to have the time or the energy or the commitment to carry out the constant battle that's required to get outside of, uh, you know, McNeil or, or you know, Dan Rather or somebody like that. The easy thing to do, you know, you come home from work, you're tired, you've had a busy day, you know, you're not going to spend the evening carrying out a research project. So you turn on the tube and say it's probably right. You know, or you look at the headlines in the paper and then you watch the sports or something. Because uh, and, and that's, that's basically the way the system of indoctrination works. Sure, the other stuff is there, but you're going to have to work to find it. Modern industrial civilization has developed within a certain system of convenient myths. The driving force of modern industrial civilization has been individual material gain, which is accepted as legitimate, uh, even praiseworthy, on the grounds that uh, private vices yield public benefits in the classic formulation. Now, it's long been understood very well that a society is, that is based on this principle will destroy itself in time. It can only persist with whatever suffering and injustice it entails as long as it's possible to pretend uh, that the destructive forces that humans create are limited, uh, that the world is an infinite resource and that the world is an infinite garbage can. At this stage of history, either one of two things is possible. Either the general population will take control of its own destiny and will concern itself with community interests, 
guided by values of solidarity and sympathy and concern for others, or alternatively, there will be no destiny for anyone to control. As long as some specialized class is in a position of authority, it is going to set policy in the special interests that it serves. But the conditions of survival, let alone justice, require rational social planning in the interests of the community as a whole, and by now that means the global community. The question is whether privileged elites should dominate mass communication and should use this power as they tell us they must, namely to impose necessary illusions, to manipulate and deceive the stupid majority and remove them from the public arena. The question in brief is whether democracy and freedom are values to be preserved or threats to be avoided. In this possibly terminal phase of human existence, democracy and freedom are more than values to be treasured. They may well be essential to survival. Thank you. He's up there thinking for himself, and he's deciphering this tremendously overweighted body of information, which he puts into an order and gives you the feeling that you can do the same thing, that the whole thing is decipherable. And he also gives you the sense that there is a source, there's a center to the, um, to a dissenting population, although we feel that there's no center. And I think that is what re reactivated in me um, a desire to get back get reacquainted with the political scene after 30 years of alienation from it. You do hundreds of interviews and lectures, and, I'm, and you're dealing with massacres in East Timor and, and uh, invasions of Panama, etc. Pretty horrific stuff, death squads. What keeps you going? I mean, don't you get burned out on this material? Uh, well, you know, it's mainly a matter of whether you can look yourself in the mirror, I think. Oh, got to go. Get this big for out. Okay. Maybe you can say all aboard for us. Okay. All aboard. Past the hour that you agreed to. Can I? Uh... He's from Harvard. Oh, I heard that. Oh, yes, no, that's true, yeah. We'll bleep it. Sorry about making you answer that. Oh, that's okay. So it worked. <laughs> did we hit it in two minutes? Or? Well, we, we, we did pretty well. Actually, that means less sports, and that's fine okay. with me. You know, the poor people out there, they don't know what's going on. If the people knew what you say here today, there'd be a, a hell of a change. Thank you. On that optimistic note, Professor Chomsky, thank you very much indeed. So how did it go? Oh, I thought it was sort of, sort of technical sounding. But um, you know, there, was, there wasn't much of a rhythm. Did you ever think for, of running for president? <laughs> if I ran for president, first thing I'd do is tell people not to vote for me. <laughs> Guy's got to go home. He still, really does. Yeah. And people still believe, people still believe that the Celtics lost in the world championship. Thanks. Thank you.